A different draft for different times, but presiding over it as always, NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman. He's at the NHL Network Studios in New Jersey, along with the familiar sights of the draft board. And spread out across the U.S. and Canada, each of the 31 NHL teams draft headquarters, general managers hoping to make a choice that will spark their franchises. But tonight, let's face it, it's all about the future. We've got eyes on more than 40 of the top draft eligible prospects from around the world, each hoping to hear their name called. So much about this year unusual and uncertain, but what remains the same is that for the sixth straight year, NBC Sports is here to bring you the NHL Drafts. And with that, we say hello, everyone. Welcome inside our NHL and NBC studio. Liam McHugh alongside Pierre Maguire. The NHL draft, as you know, was supposed to take place back in June. It was supposed to take place up in Montreal. But the world has changed. The sports world, is a, it's adjusting. And as we showed you, everything is spread out. We are here in Stamford, Connecticut. Our colleagues, who we do the draft with each and every year, Craig Button, Bob McKenzie, they are joining us from Toronto. We have a big night ahead, a lot to talk about. But as you guys know, COVID-19, it dominates the news, and that includes the hockey news. This with the news last night that we learned that Connor McDavid, the Oilers captain, former number one overall pick, tested positive for COVID-19. Now, according to the Oilers, McDavid feeling well. He's experiencing mild symptoms. He's in voluntary quarantine. Just the reality of the times right now, we certainly wish him a speedy recovery. But Pierre, I think you'd also have to say, you know, you see this news of McDavid, it kind of highlights just how extraordinary it was that the NHL managed to do this postseason bubble and see it all the way through. Liam, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you look at the commitment of the players and the coaches and the trainers and how committed they were. You think about the professionalism of the on and off ice officials in particular. It never would have happened had they not have been committed. The kindness and the focus of the healthcare professionals, the hotel workers, the restaurant workers. This was a smashing success by the National Hockey League. And the biggest reason why it was successful, everybody was committed. They were all in it. Tampa Bay Lightning, they win the cup, and now the question is, when will they defend this? Because it's the draft, Bob. We look to the future, but we're not really sure when we're going to see NHL hockey again. What are you hearing? Well, Liam, the 2020-21 regular season was supposed to be, or at least targeted to start, on December 1st in a couple of months. That's not going to happen. And NHL Commissioner Gary Bedman just recently on the NHL Network announced that they're sliding that date from December 1st to January the 1st, but keep something in mind. The December 1st date was always just a notional target, and as is this January 1st date. In a perfect world, yeah, December 1st, we'll be playing NHL regular season hockey. This is far from a perfect world. Put it in pencil. There are so many factors beyond the control of the NHL, from travel regulations to quarantine to the various jurisdictions on both sides of the border. So we'll put January 1 down for now. And we know about the uncertainty, but the one thing that we are certain of is there will be change. And beginning with the Tampa Bay Lightning that have to make changes to their Stanley Cup roster because of the salary cap. And then every other team, whether you fell short of your expectations, what you're looking to do, the draft serves as a real top time to not only address players for the future, but also to potentially look at what you can do presently to make trades. And I would expect in this time that we're going to see a number of trades over the next two days in the and into free agency. Yeah, Craig, we saw a couple deals leading up to today, and then earlier today this trade happened. Max Domi going to the Blue Jackets along with a third-round pick. In return, the Canadians get forward Josh Anderson for Max Domi, now on his third team in the NHL. Trade talk, of course, always the wild card on these nights. One thing that seems to be certain going forward is that the New York Rangers will select Alexi Lafreniere with the number one pick. Now, how they acquired that number one pick is pretty interesting because it's had to go through multiple draft lotteries. You expand the postseason, the league, they used the two-phase draft lottery. None of the seven teams that missed the playoffs got the top pick in phase one. It goes to phase two. The Rangers win it. That gives them the number one pick for the first time in the modern era, Craig. Yeah, and so what are the New York Rangers getting in Alexi Lafreniere? They are getting a player who will be able to contribute from day one. What does contribute mean? In my view, no less than 60 points in a full season. He makes everybody around him better. He makes teams better. And a team on the rise in New York, like the Rangers, he is going to help tremendously. 
While that decision for the New York Rangers is elementary, the LA Kings, they have to drill down on what they're going to do at number two. Do you take almost six foot five, 222 pound center Quinton Byfield from the Sudbury Wolves, a chance to be a dominant number one center in the NHL? Or Tim Stutzel, the dynamic, gets a 10 out of 10 from NHL Central Scouting on his skating ability, can play center or wing, maybe a little more polished game. Do you go across the pond to Germany for him or Byfield? Well, offense is great, but hard-hitting defense is even better. And Jake Sanderson, the top-rated American player, a freshman at the University of North Dakota, he stands out. He's big, he's physical, he's fast, he's mentally tough. I talked to his coach, Brad Berry, this morning at Dakota. He can't say enough good things about him, Liam. You know, last few players that you mentioned there might be a year or more away from making a serious splash in the NHL, but that's not the case for Alexi Lafreniere. The idea... Craig, as you allude to, you could see some instant impact. So let's dig into the why of that. Why is he ready right now? Well, he's physically, mentally, and emotionally mature. So you take all of that, and then you take the enormous skill that he has, along with a great competitive spirit. Alexi Lafreniere is not interested in playing anywhere other than where it matters. That's inside the dots, that's to the net, that's where he plays. Then he has a tremendous skill to be able to finish on that determination and competitiveness. Combine it with outstanding hockey sense and an ability to deliver when it always matters most. He's been the best player in his age group for a number of years. He will enter the NHL for the New York Rangers and be a significant addition to what they're trying to accomplish there, become a serious Stanley Cup contender. That's right, Craig. He is a mature NHL-ready player right now. He's growing to almost six foot two. He's 200 pounds, and he's ready to step in and contribute to an NHL lineup. Now, he's one of the older players in this draft. He's going to be 19 years old on Sunday. So that ag adjustment period for the National Hockey League could be less for him than a lot. He's an outstanding character player on and off the ice. Very humble in a lot of ways, but also well aware of a quiet swagger that he's got and that confidence that he has in his game. Liam, there are very few players that can come into the league as an 18 or even 19-year-old and physically handle the rough going. This is a prototypical power forward. He's a little bit like Miko Rantan, and he's a little bit like Jerome McGinley. He can bring smash mouth hockey to Broadway. The Ranger fans will love him, but the biggest thing about him, he dominated in key events. The World Junior this year, he was letter perfect. Celebrate the draft tonight. Celebrate his birthday in just a few days. For the Rangers, it's really been a fascinating roster remake while remaining competitive. You remember Capococco, the second overall pick last year. But, of course, it got pushed into overdrive and fast forward when they signed Artemi Panera into that seven-year contract in July of 2019. You add Jacob Truba into the mix. And as you try to add a face of a franchise, they say goodbye to the longtime face of the franchise. Henrik Lundqvist bought out of the final year of his contract. So... A radical remodel for the Rangers. Their GM is Jeff Gordon, and he spoke with Jamie Hirsch. Jeff, hi, good evening, and uh, congratulations on making it to this point. I know a lot of planning has gone into tonight, but how do you expect that things will change, doing everything remotely tonight from a normal draft? Well, thanks, Jamie. Hello. Um, I, I think it's going to be different. Obviously, we can't walk right next to us to the tables and look at general managers and go door to door, so to speak. So it'll be a little harder that way. But I think a lot of us have spent a, a lot of time looking at uh, these, some of these other drafts that have happened in other leagues and understand that, uh, you know, we might need a few more phones and a few more people working to, to help us make calls. But uh, I think it's going to work out pretty well. Well, the Rangers will be selecting first overall for the first time since 1969. What do you expect that having that top overall pick could do for your team? I mean, obviously, the opportunity to pick pick one in any year is exciting but you know this year obviously we, we think it's going to give us a great chance to 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 move our team forward uh help with what we're doing which has been a rebuild and and uh you know we couldn't be more excited right now uh, having that first pick so are you ready to clue us in on who you're planning on taking first overall or are you going to wait till the official moment arrives yeah, I think we'll have to wait for that official moment. We've waited this long, and, uh, you know, it seems like since uh, we won the lottery, it, it, it feels, I know it's only been a few months, but it feels like, se it feels like a year. So uh, <laughs> what's, a few, what's, a, what's a little more time here? And uh, it should be exciting when we, when we call it the name. Not really building suspense, just making us wait a little bit longer. Building up to the 2020 NHL draft, the Rangers up first. A major decision looms at pick number two is a bit of a getting to know you session. With that in mind, we enlisted the help of a special correspondent. 
Hey everyone, I'm Rutledge Wood. Now, I live in Georgia, college football country. Because of its big time TV exposure and because it serves as the primary feeder to the NFL, we get pretty familiar with the top players. And come draft day, we know who they are and where they've come from. This may be my first NHL draft, but I did my homework. USA Hockey and the NCAA have taken massive strides in terms of developing top hockey talent. But still, the majority of prospects come from Canadian or international leagues, and that's especially true this year. So instead of the SEC, ACC, or Pac-12, tonight it's all about the OHL, the DEL, and even something called the QMJHL. Let's start there. For more than 50 years, the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League has carried on a rich tradition of producing gifted offensive players, a handful of them first overall picks that transformed their franchises. Number 66, Mario Lemieux. Tonight, the New York Rangers could have that opportunity with Alexi Lafreniere. A lightning strike for Alexi Lafreniere. This year's top prospect grew up just outside of Montreal and played his junior hockey 300 miles up the St. Lawrence River in Rimouski, where a kid named Crosby played and left a permanent legacy. Heading west to the Ontario Hockey League, which has produced more first-rounders than any other developmental league, this year, several OHL players are expected to get drafted early on, headlined by Quentin Byfield. Quentin Byfield with a dandy power play goal whose similarities to King star Andre Kopitar have many penciling Byfield in as the number two pick to Los Angeles. That's no guarantee, though. With Tim Stutzla of the German Deutsche Eishockey Liga, or DEL, the second-ranked prospect on some draft boards, he's the latest example that German hockey is truly on the rise, following the country's silver medal at the 2018 Olympics. And most recently, Leon Dreisaitl becoming the first German NHL MVP. We'll also keep a close eye on the top American, Jake Sanderson. Sanderson got the shot, score! I love this kid. He's from Montana. He skates like the wind, just like his father, Jeff, a former NHL All-Star, and he could be the first defenseman taken tonight. Getting drafted is always such a special moment when the dream of making the NHL becomes that much closer to reality. And even though this draft will look and feel different, I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, I was hoping one of these prospects would be rocking the Rutledge plaid look tonight. No <laughs> such luck. Mostly shirts and ties all around. They've been thinking about this night for a long time. Rutledge mentioned it's going to look, it's going to feel different, but it's the start of really greater and bigger things for those young men. Now, Rut mentioned all the leagues that end in L, like the QMJHL. It's been a breeding ground for top talent. You go down the list, and then you see Sidney Crosby, Nathan McKinnon right there. And, of course, now we have Alexi Lafreniere. So, Pierre, let's face it, we all believe Alexi Lafreniere is going to go number one. That sets up a very significant decision for the L.A. Kings. We bring up a tale of the tape, which is not always fair, when Quentin Byfield is one of the guys on the tale of the tape. Tim Stutzla is not a small guy, but everyone's a little bit smaller than Quentin Byfield. So the Kings, they have a decision here. What are they considering? You know, Liam, you wear a lot of hats around NBC Sports Network, but the one thing you know is some of the sports you cover, size matters a ton, and you can't teach it. Quentin Byfield at 6'4", almost 220 pounds, is bigger than Stutzla, skates very well for a big man that size. Stutzla may be the best pure skater in the draft, but he doesn't have the size or power component that eventually you're going to see from Quinton Byfield. So if I were the Los Angeles Kings, especially knowing that Ante Kopitar's not getting any younger, yep. knowing that Jeff Carter is not getting any younger, I would take Quinton Byfield. All right. For the LA Kings, second straight year that they've had a top five pick. So another pivotal, mm -hmm. pivotal draft for President Luke Robitaille, who earlier spoke with Jamie Hirsch. Hi, Luke. Good evening. Tonight will be uh, the highest that the Kings have drafted since, of course, selecting Drew Doughty back in 2008, second overall. We know a lot about what he means to your franchise. So how important do you think having a pick this high will be to your team? It's, uh, you know, obviously this year is a great draft, but it's, uh, you know, you get to pick number two, you're going to get a, 
A great player. I mean, last time with Drew, he was such a difference maker in our franchise and what he's done. And uh, our fans are still <laughs> grateful and thankful we, we got to pick uh, Drew at the time. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement uh, within the Kings community. Between today and tomorrow, you actually have the second most picks in this draft with 11 total, four in the top 60 alone. So do you view this draft in particular as one of the most important ones in making your team a winner again? Uh, we knew this draft was important. It was important last year, too. I mean, we, since 19, uh, since 2017, we haven't traded any draft picks away. And uh, and it was uh, Rob Blake uh, as a group. They were, uh, this was their mission for them. They always said they weren't going to trade away any and then try to start rebuilding. At the time, even though, you know, we had a really good team, uh, uh, you know, that, that was still going from our 2014 Stanley Cup, but uh, definitely last year and this year, those are two very important drafts for our organization. Well, good luck today and tomorrow, and thanks so much for the time. Thank you. It's good seeing you. So a big moment, big decision coming up, but you figure it this way. The top three are the top three. Obviously, the easier choices there at one and three, the decision at number two. But let's talk about some of the more intriguing prospects outside of that group. Pierre, you lead off. Yaroslav Askarov, he's a Russian-born goaltender, tremendous, catches right-handed. Most goalies catch left-handed, so they call him a silly cider in the scouting profession. Very athletic, very good down low, active glove, catches a club, buck, uh, puck excuse me, unbelievably well. The big thing I think about it, Spencer Knight in 2019, Carey Price in 2005, Marc-Andre Fleury in 2003, and Mark Martin Burr, uh, Broder in 1990. He's in that class! Cole Perfetti, an outstanding offensive player. At the August 2019 Halinka Gretzky Tournament, Yaroslav Askarov, Cole Perfetti, and Hendrix Lapierre were clearly the best three players in that tournament, which is a real lead-in to the 2020 draft. You mentioned Lapierre, biggest wild card in the first round. In 2019, in that summer at the Halinka, he was projected as a top 10 prospect elite playmaking center this past weekend he scored three goals and five points in the first two games of the quebec league season scouts were flocking to see him reason why in between those two great accomplishments he had three head and neck injuries he's a medical wild card we'll keep an eye on where or if he goes in the first round yeah, Bob, so great to see LaPierre on the ice, healthy and productive. We're moving closer to the start of the 2020. And look at it, Jake Sanderson, the top American prospect in the draft. Sanderson name a familiar one. His father, Jeff, a forward who played in over 1,100 NHL games. Jake, however, is a defenseman, and he's on a path to become the first player from Montana to skate in an NHL game. I think Jake was about three and a half years old and we did a little um, mommy and me learn to skate. He really just loved sport. As a young child, as time went on, just did more and more hockey and, and always loved it. From a young age, just seeing my dad and um, watching him when I was younger. Sanderson shoots the save, he goes! Seeing him smile all the time and celebrate with his teammates is kind of something you know, I wanted to do it for a really long time. It was always important to me to have all my boys play hockey. For me to teach the boys the lessons of just about being a good teammate and, you know, etiquette in the locker room and effort on the ice. So it's always been a really close relationship to the game. Being, you know, the little kid in the dressing room around all those big guys was pretty special. And just watching my dad do his dream was also very special, too. Buck in the USA zone, picked up by Sanderson. Left wing in tight, Sanderson heads to the net, scores! Looked like his father, Jeff Sanderson, there. I always loved that defensive side of the game, and I was always I encouraged him to try to be more offensive, but he just loved being, you know, that defender. When I was younger, I had pretty good vision. I was a pretty good backward skater as well, and um, I think it was my band of year I had to sign up um, for a position, and I chose defense, and it kind of stuck for a while. Jake was invited to uh, try out for the USND TP program in Plymouth and you know it was his decision. It was probably the hardest decision um, as parents we had to make um, just to let him go so far at such a young age. It was kind of hard. It's so far away from home and it was my first time moving away. It was definitely something different I had to get used to. Jake's rise over the last two years has been remarkable. Just speaks volumes to who he is. Work at left point, Sanderson took the shot. Go! 
we're going to see that same growth continue here in the next couple of years as he moves and launches into an NHL career. I am so excited for the draft day for these boys, and I'm just going to be the proudest mom when his name is called. Obviously a little bit nervous just because it's something that I've been looking forward to for a really long time, and it'll be really special to spend that moment with both my parents and my older brother as well. So father-son hockey talent, different skill sets though. Jeff Sanderson, a forward, goal scorer, 17 NHL seasons for seven different franchises. Jake Sanderson, number eight ranked prospect in the 2020 draft, the top ranked American. All right, Bob, let's start there because I think everyone agrees. It's consensus. He is the top ranked American, but not everybody's on the same page to where he should be selected in this draft. Well, you're right. We've got him number eight on our consensus rankings. Jamie Drysdale of the Erie Otters is the top-ranked defenseman. He's at number four in our rankings. But what I can tell you is that I do know there are National Hockey League teams out there that have Sanderson ahead of Drysdale. Not the majority of them, but certainly more than one. And one team actually has him as one of the top three prospects in this entire draft, ahead of one of either Stutzla or Byfield. This is a player, if he punches up into the top five of the draft and goes ahead of Drysdale, it would not be an enormous surprise. But consensus being consensus, these were the top two defensemen. Drysdale, the top defenseman, Jake Sanderson, the second. Well, you know, I live in Calgary, Alberta, and I got the opportunity to watch Jake Sanderson play <laughs> Bantam hockey. I also saw Josh Morris here, the Winnipeg Jets, play Bantam hockey. And the similarities for me are eerily similar. The skating of Sanderson, the power in his game, the ability to get the puck up the ice, ja Jake Sanderson has only taken significant strides forward since he was a Batham. And certainly a comparison to Josh Morrissey as a top defenseman in the National Hockey League is appropriate. You know, Liam, I got to tell you, Jeff Sanderson was an outstanding offensive player, his father, but Jake has this mental toughness, this character to his game. He's got amazing peripheral vision. He makes the players around him better, not just a defense partner, but also the forwards. The biggest thing is he's a wrecking machine on the back <laughs> end. He's just a physically dynamic player. And when you talk to his head coach, Brad Berry, out at the University of North Dakota, I talked to him today, he can't say enough good things about the young man. This is a special, special player. And if he's there at eight, Bob McKenzie and Craig Button, the Buffalo Sabres will be doing high fives in their draft office. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, he's a freshman at North Dakota. Their season starts in November. He's at the arena tonight. That's where he's watching this draft. And earlier, he chatted with Jamie. Jake, you are a native of Whitefish, Montana, and nobody in NHL history has ever been drafted in the first round coming out of Montana. So what would it mean to you, your family, your friends, your coaches, really the whole Montana hockey community for you to be drafted in the first round? Yeah, that'd be huge and very exciting. Um, there's a lot of hockey players and a lot of hockey fans in Montana, so to be able to represent them, that means a lot to me. I know you've got a deep NHL history, your dad Jeff playing more than 1,100 NHL games, but you were only five years old when he officially hung up the skate. So what memories do you have of dad playing hockey? Um, I remember a lot just because I was pretty young when he was playing, but... I remember moving around places, just being little, and uh, I remember a bit going in the rink with him as well. How would you describe your emotional state right now? You're excited, you're nervous, did you sleep well last night? Um, yeah, I actually slept pretty good last night. It was uh, kind of surprising, but I'm a little nervous, but mostly just excited for it. I know that I see the North Dakota colors there in the background. Tell me a little bit about your setup for draft night, which of course is so different from any draft night that you would have expected. Yeah, obviously not. It's, the, it's not the traditional draft where you go, and obviously it was going to be in Montreal this year, but we don't get to have that. So I think the people here at North Dakota and all the media people and around the rink, they're trying to make it as real as it can, and they're doing a great job for us. Well, best of luck. Thanks so much for the time, and try to have fun tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. For the Americans, this draft figures to be a little less top-heavy than last year. Certainly some intriguing prospects along the way. You see Brendan Brisson, the son of Pat Brisson, the agent, and ah, Alex Tux, the younger brother, in this as well. Love look at the draft headquarters for the New York Rangers. I was half expecting everyone just to have their feet up on the table, casually waiting for things to get going, because let's face it, this pick shouldn't be that stressful. Alexi Lafreniere, seen here with his family. He has been on this path for years, and now the kid from Quebec is ready to step into the spotlight of New York City. Lafreniere works in, shoots.
His skill set is vast. There's no question about that. Alexei Lafreniere has been identified as the top player in the draft for quite some time. Unbelievable skill. He's got size. He's a very talented winger. He's so smart. His vision of play is so big and brilliant. He's been dangerous. He can threaten in so many different ways. We've seen the evidence of all of those things coming together as he's dominated major junior hockey in Canada. The bigger the game, the harder the challenges. He always rises up to it. My overall game offensively, I think that's uh, uh, something I can really help a team in the NHL. I've been training a lot, getting stronger. Well, I'm a lot on the ice, a lot in the gym, and uh, I'm getting better as a player. That reminds me somewhat of Sidney Crosby, never satisfied with their individual game. When he got to Rimouski, there was another pressure to be compared with uh, Sidney Crosby. I'm not the same player as Crosby, and uh, I tried to be myself, tried to create my own path, and uh, that's what I did. Ramuski is a special place to play, so for me it was uh, the perfect fit. The first selection in the 2020 NHL draft belongs to the New York Rangers. I uh, was really happy, um, you know, really nice city. They have a really good team, really good players. Very exciting to see the logo of New York, and uh, you know, we'll see what happens next. I've been dreaming of being drafted in the NHL uh, growing up, so uh, for me it's going to be really special for sure. All right, live pictures. Alexi Lafreniere and his family waiting just like all of us, expecting to hear his name called first in this NHL draft. Craig, number one pick, New York City, Madison Square Garden. That stage is not built for everyone. Make the case, why is it built for Alexi Lafreniere? I haven't seen a spotlight too bright for Alexi Lafreniere, where he hasn't not just performed, he's excelled. It doesn't matter if it was at the U-17 tournament, whether it was at the Lincoln Gretzky tournament, the World Junior, the Quebec League, the CHL, all he does is rise his, raise his game to the highest levels. And it will be no different in New York, no different with the bright lights of Broadway. Alexi Lafreniere was built and made to deliver in the biggest moments. He's not a flashy personality, but there's a real humility to him as well now off, off the ice. Uh, he's a guy that always deflects to his teammates, always gives credit to somebody else. Uh, humble almost to a fault, except that he's not really because there's also an unbelievably quiet swagger that goes along with his on-ice game. The Rangers were doing a Zoom call with him, and Jeff Gordon, the general manager, was asking him, now, about your skating. Now, the, the implication of the question is, he's elite hockey sense, he's elite playmaking, elite goal-scoring ability, elite physical play. The skating, they talk about, well, you know what, it's very good, but it's not elite as his other qualities. So when Gordon was asking him about, he knew and he sensed, oh, so a little smile, almost a smirk on his face during the interview with Jeff Gordon and the New York Rangers, as if to say, oh, so you think you've got some questions about my skating. He didn't say that, <laughs> but that's what the Rangers it took from the little smirk that they got from him. Um, very humble, but also very confident of his ability. It, it, Pierre, it sounds like he's more Jeter than Broadway Joe for New York sports. I think that's more than fair to say. I think the biggest thing about him is when you're a Francophone in the province of Quebec and you've risen all these levels hockey-wise and everybody's scrutinizing you every single day, there's a certain way you have to carry yourself. And he's carried himself impeccably the entire time. And going to the World Junior the way he did, getting hurt, coming back, leading Canada to a gold medal uh, last year in Slovakia, phenomenal. I mean, this guy's got, he's a real deal. He's a little bit Jerome McGinley. He's a little bit Miko Rantanen. He's a power forward that can play a supremely skilled game, Liam. Yeah, and Craig, he's been drawing comparisons to Sidney Crosby for a long time simply because they play for the same junior team and they had so much su success. But this is not Sidney Crosby, and he'll tell you that. No, he isn't Sidney Crosby, but he did something that only Sidney Crosby has done previously, and that's being named the top junior player in the CHL in two consecutive seasons. And as Bob pointed out earlier, you know, one of the biggest things for Alexi Lafreniere is how determined he is to be the best. It never stops for him. Lots of talent, lots of determination. We'll see. We expect that he will be the first name called tonight. The Rangers hold the pick. That's followed by the Kings. We'll hear from the commissioner next. Dream begins. 
lace them up, hit the ice, and wonder, one day, this could be me. Crosby scores! Guy Lafleur. Mario Lemieux. Mike Medano. Matt Sundin. Alexander Ovechkin. Tonight, all of the blue shirt eyes of the Big Apple look east of Montreal to the picturesque Quebec City of Rimouski for its next hockey hero. What a lightning strike for Alexei Lafreniere! And if Rimouski sounds familiar, you're right. Pittsburgh Penguins select from Rimouski, the Quebec Major Junior League, Sidney Crosby. 15 years have passed since a generational talent shined in the Rimouski spotlight. Now, can Alexi Lafreniere follow Sid the Kid's path to greatness? A superstar in the making! Across the border, American Jake Sanderson hopes bloodlines... Sanderson shoots a save. He scores! Jeff Sanderson has the hat trick. ...will propel the Montana native to blue line brilliance. Drop pass, Sanderson got the shot! Score! It's the dawning of a new day. The day your long-awaited journey begins. Patrick Kane. To hear your name, to get that hug. Connor McDavid. And show that smile, dreams will come true. Jack Hughes. Let's go, baby. It's the 2020 NHL Draft, tonight. So players like Quentin Byfield, you work and you sacrifice, you hope and dream. And tonight, he and 30 other young athletes will be rewarded. That includes this man, Tim Stutzloh, another bow tie enthusiast. He's watching from Germany. For the fans at home, the hope is that their team can make a major mark. We are just about ready for the NHL drafts as we send you to Commissioner Gary Bettman in New Jersey. Good evening, and welcome to the 2020 NHL draft. Obviously, we are not on the floor of a packed and excited Bell Center in Montreal as we had planned and would have much preferred. Rather, tonight and tomorrow, we are coming to you from the studios of the NHL Network in Secaucus, New Jersey, and through over 100 virtual connections from club draft command centers and prospects living rooms throughout North America and the rest of the world. So let me start the way I normally would and thank the Canadians organization, beginning with Jeff Molson, both for the work they did in bidding to host this draft and for their understanding as we continue to adapt to circumstances beyond our control amid the challenges of 2020. Montreal, we look forward to you playing host to another draft very soon. As for tonight and tomorrow, some things are different than the most recent drafts. Some are even throwbacks to an earlier era when NHL drafts were conducted at league headquarters or hotel ballrooms with only staff in attendance and draft picks notified of their selection by phone. That all changed in 1980 when, for the first time, the NHL draft was staged as a public event in, of all places, Montreal. But the most important thing about the draft has remained constant since its inception in 1963. And however and wherever it has been held in the intervening 57 years, the draft is where a young man's dreams come true and where the foundations of franchises are built. Another aspect of the draft that remains unchanged, whether it is held in late June or early October, is that it serves as the pivot point at which the league turns its attention from the season just completed to the one coming up next. It was just over a week ago that we celebrated the successful completion of our 2019-20 return to play with the crowning of the Tampa Bay Lightning and Stanley Cup champions. And tonight, following discussions with the NHL Players Association, and based on what we have learned and what we know and what we even still don't know, I can say that we are now focused on a January 1 start for next season. Given the increasing impact that talented young players are making in our game, we can expect that there will be prospects chosen who tonight will make their NHL debuts on opening night of next season. And we can't wait to welcome them to our league and to be amazed by what they can do. So let's get started. In the first round, 
Once a team is put on the clock, teams will have five minutes to make their selections. The first selection in the 2020 NHL draft belongs to the New York Rangers. New York Rangers, you are on the clock. So Bob mentioned it, and you just heard from the commissioner looking like a January start. As for the Rangers, they've been in this spot since August. Lafreniere was the pick then. He's still the pick. He's been trending this way since he was 16, Bob. But you got to figure tonight, not exactly how he imagined it all playing out. Yeah, this was supposed to happen three-plus months ago at the Bell Centre in downtown Montreal. It was supposed to be a coronation. 20,000 Rockets fans cheering on the hometown boy as he becomes the first French-Canadian to go number one overall since Marc-Andre Fleury in 2003 and the first Quebecois skater to go first overall since Vinny Lecavalier in 98. Instead, you see him sitting there with his parents, Hugo, his mom, his dad, Hugo, his mom, Natalie, his sister, Lori Jane, at their home in San Eustache, Quebec. Now, San Eustache is only 20-odd miles from the Bell Centre, but boy, it's a million miles in atmosphere of what it could have been like for him. This draft party tonight is going to be a draft party for four for the Lafreniers. They are in San Eustache, which is a COVID red zone, which means the province only allows those who live in the household to be there. So that's it for a draft party is what you see is what you get. But it's a special moment for him and his family. He's used the extra time to get bigger, stronger, faster, hitting the gym every day. He's now six foot two, 200 pounds. Uh, he's also taken up golf and by all accounts gotten pretty good at it. You see he's grown a little bit of a beard there. So it's a good thing that he's being drafted by the New York Rangers and not Lou Lamarillo's New York Islanders. Otherwise, that facial hair would have to go. And we should point out that when Jeff Gordon steps to the microphone here and says they're taking Alexi Lafreniere, it's going to be the first time that Lafreniere will have heard that. The Rangers did not commit at any time to him that they were taking him. That's why he looks a little nervous there, even though I think all the rest of us have got this figured out. Yeah, Bobby's not the only guy to grow a quarantine beard. Pierre Maguire can attest to that. He did the same. So, Craig, this is a guy who said his favorite player is Patrick Kane. But, and I think we're going to hear that a lot tonight from a lot of different players. But you see him comparing better to someone else. Yeah, I see him like Miko ranting in. Big players that drive the middle of the ice, that drive the net, that understand where they need to be productive, and then they get there. And then once they get there, their tremendous skills take over from that point. They open up goaltenders. And like Rantanen, who plays with McKinnon, and now one plus one equals three, not only for the duo, but also for the team, Alexi Lafreniere has the exact same capabilities. Whoever he plays with is going to be that much better, and by extension, the team is going to be that much better. That's the impact he has with his approach to play. So while uh, Alexi Lafreniere sits there with his family and waits, Rangers fans waiting on this rebuild, but it's been kind of a radical rebuild, but we take you back to the beginning of this because it's February 2018, the letter to the fans, this idea that they want to make some changes, have competitive players that combine speed, skill, character, but you may lose some familiar faces in the process, guys that we all care about, but we're trying to ensure that we're building a foundation to be a Stanley Cup contender. That means key players traded for draft capital and some big names on that list, and then you go out and you draft Cabo Caco, and you make a big signing in Artemi Panarin. Then, of course, last year, Igor Shostorkin, he emerges in net. The Rangers win the draft lottery. They could add a face to the franchise tonight for their future, but this is the man who has been the longtime face of the franchise, Henrik Lundqvist, bought out of the final year of his contract, a guy who was selected by the Rangers back in the year 2000. Similarly, did everything and anything for them in net. But this Rangers team, Pierre, we talk about rebuild. This is a different type of rebuild. How excited should these fans be for the next few seasons? The New York Rangers have now become must-see TV. Uh, every time they play, you're going to want to watch the Rangers. They're going to play an up-tempo attacking style. Lafreniere is going to be a dynamic power forward. You obviously got Artemi Panarin that John Davidson and Jeff Gordon did a great job recruiting him out of Columbus. They've got a really good young head coach in David Quinn. David Quinn just became a better head coach because they're going to draft Alexis Lafreniere. There's nothing wrong with that. To me, the biggest thing about the Rangers, 
how much fun they're going to be to watch. And they're going to stimulate a lot of eyeballs to watch that team play. Yeah, because this is a New York Rangers team that got into that expanded postseason. They went in, quickly exited. But this is a team that was exciting. They were fun to watch down the stretch of the regular season. They have some talented players in Zibanejad. They have Panarin. They have some young goalies. And looking to add a big piece right now, the Rangers with the first pick in the NHL draft. Let's go back to the commissioner. The first selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by New York Rangers general manager Jeff Gordon. With the first pick in the 2020 NHL draft, the New York Rangers are proud to select from the Rimouski Oceanic, Alexi Lafreniere. So there you have it, an unprecedented postseason, a draft lottery unlike any other in hockey history. And ultimately, though, it leads to a very predictable first overall selection. Lafreniere, as you mentioned, he's really been on this path for several years at this point since he was 16, now five days before he turns 19. He joins the New York Rangers. It's a different draft, but he still gets the sweater, puts it on. Now a member of the New York Rangers. Craig, let's talk about impact with this guy because let's face it, these are Rangers fans. They figure big city, number one pick. They want to see some instant impact and you believe this is a guy who can make that. No question in my mind, Liam. He's ready to contribute. What does contributing mean? It means that you're going to get 60 points or more in your initial full season in the NHL. He attacks the net. He attacks the areas where you get rewarded. He has an edge to his game. There is no style of game that he cannot excel at. Skill, skating, power, tight games, important games, critical moments. He delivers it all for a team. And when you consider that Alexi Lafreniere is physically mature, that he's mentally and emotionally mature, and we talk about playing inside the tackles, that's playing inside the dots. He's not interested in playing where it doesn't matter. Like a running back in the NFL, if you can run between the tackles, you're going to have a lot of success. I don't see anything but success for Alexi Lafreniere with the New York Rangers. I mean, physically, it's a jump no matter who you are, but not nearly as much of a jump for him, Pierre. No, I don't think so. And I think the biggest reason why he's more physically developed, Liam, than most other young players, you can see the size of him right there. Obviously, he's got a pretty large father as well. But <laughs> to me, the, big, the biggest thing about this player is the composure level. When you watch them at the World Junior this year in particular, there was no intimidation factor at all. He, he was leading by example, a dominant player. You know, Craig drafted or helped draft Jerome Ginla, and he talked about Miko Rantanen. I see a lot of Jerome Ginla in, in his game as well. He just got uh, inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. That's pretty high praise. This is a very special player. Bob? Well, one thing we know for sure is that he won't be able to wear his favorite number for the New York Rangers. That's number 11. I think it's taken uh, twice, actually. Retired <laughs> twice. Mark Messier, Vic Hadfield. Uh, left friend here's second favorite number is number nine. Sorry, out of luck on that one, too. Adam Graves and Andy Bathgate. I do believe that Lafreniere has, in his own mind, come up with a number that he'd like to wear, but it's closely guarded secret. Uh, they don't want to get into the counterfeit uh, jersey <laughs> sales that are right there. And that is actually a serious problem. Uh, but in any case, uh, we'll find out soon enough what number he's going to wear for the Rangers. When you're in any kind of a rebuild, you're going to need a little bit of luck if you want to make a jump from outside the postseason to being a cup contender. And you look at top three overall picks in consecutive drafts, and it's equaled success right at the top of Genny Malkin and Sidney Crosby. Three cups for them. Jonathan Taze, Patrick Kane, three cups for them. Steven Stamkos, Victor Heaven, and they just won the Stanley Cup. And then down at the bottom, of course, you have... Capococco, second overall pick last year in 2019, and now it looks like, now we know, Alexi Lafreniere, obviously, in with him, the number one pick here. That was one of those decisions that, hey, listen, once it was cemented that the Rangers had the number one pick, we knew it was coming, it happened, but now you look ahead to the second overall pick pick here and it's the LA Kings and this is a team that they've had the number two pick in the past they had it not that long ago you go back to 2008 they had a decision to make they made that decision and let's be honest it worked out it was Drew Doughty as you take a look at the LA Kings draft headquarters so Bob another decision for this team you have Quentin Byfield you have Tim Stutzla 
to different players, a left wing and a center. Take me inside the decision-making process for this organization right now. Well, it's very close. It's, it's really 6-5 pick them if you want to put it that way. Um, if you survey NHL teams, you'll get more or less an even split. Um, we put Stutzla at number two over Byfield on our rankings, but only by the slimmest of margins. I mean, almost an infinitesimal difference between the two. Now, in Stutzla's favor, he has elite hockey sense, elite speed, 10 out of 10 skating rank from National Hockey League Central Scouting. Uh, he's incredible dynamic and explosive quality who commands the puck and can make things happen when he has it. He played really well against men in the German League and was excellent at the World Junior Championship. Now, Byfield's hockey sense is well above average, but maybe not elite. He moves incredibly well for such a big kid who only recently turned 18. He's now almost six foot five and 222 pounds. Uh, there is a bit more inconsistency to Byfield's game, and his overall game may be a little bit more raw, but boy, oh boy, I'll tell you, there are teams that look at him and say, how can you pass on an almost six foot five, 222 pound center that skates like the wind, has great hands, can make plays, can score goals, and can create space for himself in front of the net, and that he's going to be that dominant, point producing, number one center in the NHL. So the conventional wisdom here in the days leading up to this draft is that the Kings are favoring Byfield. Craig, 30 seconds. You're in that draft headquarters. You're making the case for who? There it is. War <laughs> Well, what I would say, Liam, is, is that with Quentin Byfield, you have Anze Kopitar, who I see Byfield as being very similar in type. Why not let him learn under, under Anze Kopitar? And when you look at the West with the likes of Nathan McKinnon, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, you need a player like Byfield to match up. It's a, it's a good way to build. We'll see who they take. Let's go to the commissioner. The second selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Vice President and General Manager of the Los Angeles Kings, Rob Blake. The Los Angeles Kings are proud to select with the second pick in the 2020 entry draft. From Sudbury Wolves of the entire Hockey League, Quinton Byfield. So the celebration on, Quentin Byfield and his family. He's the number two overall pick. He's young, he's big, he's fast, he's skilled, and he is now the highest drafted black player in the history of the NHL. It's something that he says he embraces. He wants to be a role model, wants to pave the way for other young black players. Says this game is for everyone. Kings fans, they should be excited because, you know, Craig, as you alluded to, you made the comparison to Andre Kopitar right now as we watch Quentin Byfield. He's taking the suit jacket off, and he's putting that Kings jersey on. You have to believe. Kings fans, very exciting. Big, fast, talented. And we go back, take me a little bit deeper into that comparison. Kopitar by field. Well, the, the, they've watched Anze Kopitar be a star for the LA Kings, lead them to Stanley Cups, and be one of the very best players all around in the National Hockey League. And that's what I see in Quentin Byfield. It's He wants to make an impact on every square inch of ice. And it took Anze Kopitar a little bit of time to get comfortable with imposing himself. And what, once he did become comfortable, he was a really difficult player to handle one-on-one. -on -one. I feel the same way about Quentin Byfield. Once he gets comfortable imposing himself, he will be more than a handful. And for LA Kings fans, you watch the progression of Anze Kopitar. What an unbelievable opportunity for the young Quentin Byfield to learn under the guiding hand of one of the great centers in the league over the last 10 years in Anze Kopitar. Pierre, at this point, we're almost a half an hour into the draft coverage, and we have not used the phrase tremendous upside yet. We have to use that phrase, I think, by law in a draft. You have to. But it really applies to this guy. There's no question about it. Remember, Anse Kopitar was the 11th pick overall in the 05 draft. This is a player that's going to be the second, or is the second overall pick. When you talk about Quinton Byfield. Now, some people are going to say he's a little bit slow to the party because of what happened at the World Junior this year for Canada, where he was not very successful. All that being said, I'll take you back to the 2013 World Junior, where a guy by the name of uh, Nathan McKinnon in six games had zero goals for Canada. This is a player that eventually became a dominant player in the National Hockey League. I think Quinton Byfield will do very much the same thing. He's an outstanding player. I've been watching him since he was a minor midget, so I know his body of work really well. Tremendous talent.
So, Quentin Byfield to the LA Kings. Bob, take me inside the person and the player that they're getting. Well, Quentin Byfield's from Newmarket, Ontario. So is Connor McDavid. Uh, Quentin Byfield is represented by agent Jeff Jackson of the Wasserman Orr Hockey Group. So is Connor McDavid. Quentin Byfield played his minor hockey with the York Simcoe Express. Well, so did Connor McDavid. Now, he's not Connor McDavid, and he's not Eric Lindros either. Although, when you see the physical dimension that he's got, that sort of man amongst boys uh, presence in, in the Ontario Hockey League, you could be forgiven for thinking that he's not as physically punishing as Eric. Eric Lindros at all, but he can use his size to dominate his peer group with his feet and his hands. But there's also a fun factor to this guy, and we saw him earlier with the double-breasted white jacket <laughs> that he took off to put on. Uh, that's from the designer Eleventy, an Italian designer. He's got his bow tie. He's got more than 30 or 40 in his collection, and I think the folks in L.A. are going to really get a kick out of the style and the personality of Quentin Byfield as he gets more comfortable on the big stage and starts to express his personality a lot more because he expresses himself very well on the ice and I think he's really growing into the fact that he's got a, a great personality off the ice as well. I, I think I, we should... <laughs> I know you're semi-retired. Are you telling us that eventually you're going into, what, fashion reporting? Is He's that the next step For the Today yeah, Show. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm auditioning for a spot on the red carpet, <laughs> if we could get that done. And it was worth noting, too, that Tim Stutzel, and I don't know if this... We'll have to find out if this was by accident or not. He's also fashioning the bow tie. So the bow tie Very is true. in at the 2020 draft. Oh. Greg, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's Quentin Bowtie Bo uh, Byfield. That's what he is. And, you know, Bob just talked about him getting comfortable under the big spotlight. And, and once he does, and trust me, he will get comfortable, he has a chance to be really impactful. I mean, you use the word tremendous upside, tremendous potential. If you're looking at one player that could end up being the best player from this draft, you're looking at number 55 here on your screen in Quentin Byfield. He has a lot of ability, a lot of talent, and I really believe that he is still scratching the surface of how good he can be, and he's already really good. They mentioned Stutzler there in his bow tie. This could be the easiest pick coming up because the number three pick belongs to the <laughs> Ottawa Senators. Three picks in the first round for them. Two picks in the top five. You see them there at three and at five. I think we all know where they're going. Pierre, I'll start with you. Tim Stutzler has to be the pick. You would imagine, and if it's not, then there's something that uh, they're not seeing properly in Ottawa, and they're a very good scouted team. Their amateur scouts are fantastic. I think the biggest thing with Ottawa is if you get Stutzla, you're getting a player that manufactures instantaneous offense. There are not a lot of playmaking wingers. He's not just a scoring winger. He's a playmaking winger as well, so he's a multidimensional weapon. He really is. Greg, we expect to see Stutzla. What can the Senators expect from him? Well, he, he's massively creative. He's got an imagination for the game and for playmaking that is tremendous. He played left wing this year in the DEL. He's been a center his entire life. I expect him to be a center, and he's got this creativity like Patrick Kane. This is the guy that reminds me of Patrick Kane. He's bold, and he's determined and highly skilled. It's watching from Germany just after 1 a.m. there. Right now, let's go back to the commissioner for the pick at number three, the Senators. To make the third selection in the 2020 NHL draft, the Senators have enlisted the services of a special guest who also happens to be a graduate of the University of Ottawa. Here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. Thank you, Johnny. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jeopardy. Our category today is the NHL. And here is the clue for you. With the third pick in the 2020 NHL draft, the Ottawa Senators choose this player. The correct response, who is Tim Stutzel? Alex Trebek in to make the pick. Tim Stutzler, he is the selection. He's the newest member of the Ottawa Senators. What a way to be welcomed into the NHL, and what a run for German hockey. You go back to 2018, they take silver at the Olympics. Last season, Leon Dreisaitl wins the scoring title, wins the MVP, and now Tim Stutzler selected third overall. The Senators 
get a prime talent here. Craig, are, uh, Craig and Pierre already weighed in. Bob, this pick for Ottawa, what does it do for a franchise that is really trying to build up here? Well, I don't think there's any question this is a big day for them to have the number three overall pick and get Stutzla to be coming back and pick the number five overall pick to go along with a guy like Brady Kachuk up front. Uh, that's a big building block. Thomas Shabbat on the blue line. This uh, rebuild that the Ottawa Senators are going through, this is a big day for them when they can load two more major pieces. Stutzla is a dynamic presence. As I said, there was so little to choose between him and Byfield. If you talk to the scouts, he's got a great shot. He can play center. He can play wing. It'll be interesting to see whether the Sens view him more as a center than a winger, and they certainly would like to improve the middle of the ice. But uh, it doesn't matter where he's going to play. He's going to have an instant impact. And a lot of people believe he's NHL ready right now. Yeah, you look at some German-born players selected in the first round the last 25 years. The NHL draft has been held 57 times. Five players born and trained in Germany have been selected in the first round. Never more than never one in any year. We could see three. I know you saw Danny Heatley on there, born in Germany. Played for Team Canada, though. But this could already a big night for German hockey. It could be an even bigger night for German hockey as two more uh, German players could go in the first round. Now, Alexi Lafreniere, he goes number one. He says his favorite player is Patrick Kane. That's not who he compares to, though. Would you say that this is a more appropriate comparison, Stutzla to Kane, Craig? Absolutely, Lee. I mean, like Patrick Kane, it's that ability to hold on to the puck. And I talk about Tim Stutzla's creativity and his imagination. He sees things unseen in the game. He always allows for the next opportunity. And if you're playing with Tim Stutzla, you best be ready because he's understanding where the opponent is breaking down and then he's ready to take advantage. And the other thing that I absolutely love about Tim Stutzla, and he's like Peter Forsberg in this regard. The puck drops. They're not waiting to see how the game is going to unfold. They're going to take the game by the scruff of the neck and impose themselves on it. The Ottawa Senators have a terrific group of young prospects, and now this is a high-quality player that is going to only make this team that much better. And they need high-quality players. They have that pick at three. They have another pick coming up at five. They have a pick later on in the first round at 28. But do you think about this team rebuilding? Pretty interesting because this was a team that was right there on the verge. 2017, one one away from making the Stanley Cup final. One goal away from making the Stanley Cup final. But since 2018, the departures, Eric Carlson, Matt Duchesne, Mark Stone, Jean-Gabriel Pajot. You think about some other players that were on their team. Hoffman, Dezingle. Oh, if all those guys were on one team, that'd be a pretty good team. But <laughs> the Senators are a very different looking team right now. What do you think of the way they're going about this right now in their core group here? Well, it speaks to how much respect they have for their amateur scouts in particular, Liam. They knew that this 2020 draft was going to be very good. They started to stockpile picks for this draft, and you can see it's already starting to pay off. Stutzel is a spectacular player. I believe he's NHL ready. I do what your Commissioner Bettman say. There's a bunch of kids that could be playing in the NHL once we start up again. I think he'll be one of them if Ottawa wants him to be because I think athletically he can do it. But the biggest thing to me is how many NHL teams spent mucho dollars and not just money, but also airtime for scouts, decision makers, key decision makers going over to Germany to watch him play. Right from the start of the year, everybody knew this was a special player and it's carried forward to this draft. But again, maybe you get a little more bang for your buck if you're making that trip because there are a few German players who could go yeah. in the first round outside of Stutzla. So they have another pick, the Senators, as I mentioned, at five. But in between them, it's Detroit, a team that was easily the worst team in the league. They don't get that top pick. They get the fourth pick, which in the past, let's be honest, the fourth pick, it's worked out for Detroit because Steve Eiserman, their executive vice president and general manager, he was the number four overall pick by the Red Wings back in 1983. See a young Stevie Y there shaking hands. And then, of course, goes on to win three Stanley Cups as a player with Detroit. You saw the draft headquarters for the team, but Steve Eisman won't be there. The 
statement from the team here participate remotely for both days of the draft was exposed recently to an individual who tested positive for COVID-19. Steve Eiserman has received multiple negative test results. He's experiencing no symptoms, but this is all out of an abundance of caution. So we certainly wish him well, but he is not in that room as they make this selection. But Craig, I will go to you because the first three, we knew that that would be the three. We weren't sure the order of two and three, but we knew those three guys are in. It gets interesting now. Where do you think Detroit should go with this fourth overall pick? Well, let's put it this way. They need everything to make their team better. That's simply put. I mean, they need a number one goaltender. They need a number one defenseman. They need number one wingers. They need centermen. So Steve Eisenman is going to have those options. If he wants a goaltender, he can take a scar off defenseman, Jake Sanderson or Jamie Drysdale, Cole Perfetti, Lucas Raymond. If you want to go to a center, you can even look at Marco Rossi. But Steve Eisenman knows what it takes to win, both as a player and as a manager, because the Tampa Bay Lightning had his his fingerprints all over their Stanley Cup championship. Detroit Red Wings, here from Craig, it's a team that needs pretty much everything. They only have one pick here at number four. Detroit on the clock, time ticking down. We go to the commissioner for the selection for the Red Wings. The fourth selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Detroit Red Wings Director of Amateur Scouting, Chris Draper. With the fourth pick in the 2020 entry draft, the Detroit Red Wings are very excited to select from Fralunda, Lucas Raymond. Celebration on to Lucas Raymond as he becomes the first player from Sweden selected in this draft. As you mentioned, he here played in the Swedish Hockey League for Frölunda, captained by Henrik Lundqvist's twin brother, Joel. Says he's a mix between Artemi Panarin and Mitch Marner. Bob, what do you think of this pick at this spot for the Red Wings? Well, it's not surprising because Lucas Raymond is off to such a strong start in the Swedish Hockey League. One of the knocks on him last year was something he had no control over, and that was that he was playing so far down in the lineup in Fralinda that when the NHL scouts went to see him, he'd only play six, seven, eight, nine minutes a game, and that he wasn't in a position to make an impact in the game. He's doing that now. When he's in his peer group, he can make an impact. In the under-18 World Championships a couple of Aprils ago, he stepped up, scored a hat trick, and was absolutely dynamic to win a gold for the, for the Swedes. So there's never been any doubt in terms of his skill level. He's a little physically immature, but he's gotten much stronger over the course of the summer. And I think that Ray, uh, Raymond really benefited from the fact that he's been able to play some hockey this fall and some others haven't because he's looked so much stronger and he's looked a much more dominant role in the Swedish league. So Hakan Anderson, the veteran scout for the Detroit Red Wings, will be very happy that the Wings are going back to the Swedish well after they had so much success with Henrik Zetterberg and Nick Lidstrom and Nick Kronvall and on and on and on it goes. Yeah, Bob mentioned it there. you got to figure Detroit knows how to make a player from Sweden feel right at home. Pierre, you look at the Detroit Red Wings, and let's face it, they went those 25 straight seasons making the playoffs, and now they are in full rebuild some of the young talent that they have accumulated. Well, especially Maurice Sider, the defenseman that Steve Eisenman took last summer in his first draft back with the Detroit Red Wings, outstanding player, and had a real successful year in the American Hockey League before they had a pause. Lucas Raymond, Bob spot on in terms of how he grew his brand because of the ability ability to play and he was playing deeper in the lineup uh, last year when he when he obviously was being watched by scouts but I think the biggest thing is the influence of Hawken Anderson and the influence of Nicholas Cronwall two Swedish people that work in the Detroit Red Wings organization they're valued members Chris Draper Steve Eisman are going to listen to them but you get an example he can skate with the puck he can finish plays off you see how he gets the scoring areas that's pretty simple for a player like Lucas Raymond but I think the biggest thing is the comfort level in scoring positions and and when you're that comfortable with a puck in your stick about 15 to 20 feet from the net, you got a legitimate chance to be a big-time player in the league. Craig, headed to Detroit, is he going to remind hockey fans of a player in Toronto? Yeah, Mitch Marner. And like Mitch Marner, 
Lucas has the ability to be elusive and be comfortable at the same time in tight spaces, and yet he's always able to make plays in tight quarters, and that's what you have to be able to do at the National Hockey League level. When you consider his hands, and the other thing about his playmaking, don't underestimate his shooting. He's got a sneaky good shot. You saw the highlights of him scoring that hat trick in the gold medal game. Sweden had never won a gold medal to U18. Keep in mind that Lucas was... A year younger than everybody in that tournament, dominant in leading them to the gold medal. So he will not be anything but a real top offensive player once he gets to the NHL. Detroit 39 points. It was last in the NHL, 23 points fewer than any other team in the league. They add Lucas Raymond. We bring things back to the Senators. Picked up Tim Stutzla at pick three. Now up at pick five. Haven't seen a defenseman come off the board yet. Bob, might this be a place we should see the first D-man go? Yeah, I think there's a real excellent chance of that happening here, but then the decision-making process for General Manager Pierre Dorian and his staff is to decide between Jamie Drysdale, the very mobile but five foot eleven defenseman from the Erie Otters, an offensive defenseman, or does he go with the much bigger, rangier, and more physical Jake Sanderson at six two, six foot three? That's really the call to make here. It could really go either way. Now, that's not to uh, suggest that they couldn't seriously consider Cole Perfetti uh, from the Saginaw Spirit, a really gifted and skilled forward. Um, because I think Lucas Raymond would have been a player at five that the Ottawa Senators would have jumped all over. But with Steve Eiserman taking him at number four, I think now the likelihood that you're going to see a defenseman go is extremely high. And as we talked about before the draft began, we had Raymond, uh, uh, sorry, we had Sanderson at number eight. We had Drysdale at number four. But it would come as a surprise to nobody if Sanderson is in fact the number one defenseman taken in this draft because of his size and skating ability. It's going to be interesting to keep a size, Craig, on the size factor here. Jamie Drysdale, five foot eleven, under six feet. Cole Perfetti, under six feet as a forward. Will the size slip them a couple of spots in the first round? Not a big number, I wouldn't think, but that'll be interesting to see here. Well, and you think about the Ottawa Senators, too, with their blue line. They have Thomas Shabbat, a premier defenseman. They have Eric Branstrom. They have Lassie Thompson, a first-round draft pick, and Jacob Bernard Docker. All I know is if they take Drysdale, they're getting a really good right-shot defenseman. If they take Jake Sanderson, they're getting a really good left-shot defenseman that's only going to make that entire defense that much better. If it's Sanderson, it's the first American selected in this year's draft. For the Ottawa Senators, three picks in the first round, two in the top five. They looked at this draft as a transformative moment for their franchise as they try to rebuild and become a competitive team once again. So the fifth overall selection, it's the Senators as we go back to the commissioner. The fifth selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Ottawa Senators General Manager Pierre Dorian. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Alex Trebek for helping us with our third selection. We'd also like to welcome Tim Stutzla to the organization. Les Sénateurs d'Ottawa sont très fiers de choisir. The Ottawa Senators are real proud to select from the United States National Team Development Program and the University of North Dakota, Jake Sanderson. Alex Trebek and Tim Stutzle at pick three. The first American in the draft here at pick number five. Jake Sanderson watching the draft from North Dakota. He's a freshman there. I would assume clearly on a delay right here. But <laughs> <laughs> or he's got the best poker face in all of hockey. But this is the first American select. It might be a familiar name. There they are. And there's the hug. His dad, Jeff, played more than 1,100 NHL games. Jeff was a forward. This is a defenseman. What kind of a defenseman are they This getting? is a character defenseman with tremendous peripheral vision, outstanding skater, big-time player. Most teams, had some had him rated a little bit higher than where he went. But the biggest thing about Jake Sanderson is he doesn't take shortcuts. He's a guy, you talk to his coach, Brad Berry, he goes to bed at 9.30 every night. He's the first guy at the rink at 6.30 in the morning. But you get an example. He's a shutdown guy. He's a skater. He's a physical presence. He's a guy that understands how to manufacture offense off the rush, make the players around him better. Comfortable with the puck, drives hard in the net. All the little things you want to see from a defenseman, especially from the offensive side of things. But I can tell you this, Liam, he knows how to shut the door on players too. And one other thing for the Ottawa Senators and their fan base, they have, they have a defenseman 
uh, Bernard, uh, Do Jacob Bernard Docker at North Dakota. That's an Ottawa Senators draft pick who played for Canada at the World Junior. I think this is another example of Ottawa being progressive with their drafting. They're going to be able to see a lot of Sanderson and a lot of uh, Jacob Bernard Docker. When you have prospects like this, you always get great quotes from coaches, but this one's really stood out in the words of his U.S. National Team Development Program coach. He is, quote, a savage defender. He eats people up. Maybe a few years before he's eating people up in the NHL, but who is his NHL comparison, Craig? Well, I compare him to Josh Morrissey, and like Josh Morrissey, an exceptional skater and really competitive. They don't see very much space, if any at all. They get on your, get on you and get into your space and prevent you from doing what you want to do. And the fact that they're so good with their agility, their mobility, their edge work, it allows them to be confident in holding that position and close off opponents. And when you consider that Jake Sanderson played on a team that wasn't a highly offensive team and a very good offensive player, maybe not in terms of looking directly at the offensive numbers but he was critical in creating that offense because he knows where the puck needs to go next and who it needs to go to jake sanderson not only is an excellent skater he's got an outstanding mind for the game so jake sanderson the fifth overall pick he goes to the ottawa senators and we look at american demons selected in the top 10 in the last decade quinn hughes Finalist for Rookie of the Year this year. You see Zach Wierenski in there. Same draft as Noah Hannafin. How about Seth Jones and his performance during this bubble postseason? He was a marathon man, never seemed to get tired. His skill never dipped. And, of course, Jacob Truba there as well. Could become the first player from Montana to play in an NHL game, Bob. Yeah, uh, played minor hockey in Calgary, Alberta, as Craig would correctly point out. Um, and obviously <laughs> has those great Canadian bloodlines from his dad, Jeff, of course, from Hay River, North Don't take Territory. away, he was, don't take exactly. away our one American prospect here. I know, it, it's an anomaly don't this year that, that there's only two Americans ranked in the first round. But Sanderson is a good one, and, and I should point out that both those Americans have Canadian fathers. But nevertheless, Liam, to your point, uh, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. He had a great first half where he played that shutdown physical style. It was the second half of the season when he really started to pick up his offensive game and blossom. So we talked a little bit about size mattering, and there's going to be some people who say, whoa, Drysdale should have been the first defenseman taken. Um, you know, you shouldn't err on the side of caution with a guy just because he's five foot eleven and not six feet. And I might agree with that, except in the case of Sanderson, he's not just six foot two, six foot three. He's also a very fast skater. So there's a lot of speed and physical dimension to his game. And I can't imagine Drysdale is going to have to wait too much longer as we go here uh, with Anaheim picking next and obviously liking a lot of defensemen. And, and Liam, you know, one of the things about his U.S. national team development coach, Seth Apper, Seth talked about, you know, uh, being, uh, be, Jake being a savage defender. Let me tell you this. He's also got a subtlety to his defending like Scott Niedermeyer did. So he's not only savage physically, he can be savage mentally where he takes the puck off of you stealth-like and you don't even realize it's off your stick until he's going the other way so he can play it any way you want very very cerebral very very competitive and skilled i appreciate you bringing it back to the u.s national development program there because bob <laughs> this is our guy don't take him let us enjoy this moment jake sanderson now we go to the next pick though and it's anaheim and because sanderson goes at five pierre does this set up jamie drysdale i think it does i think that's probably the direction that bob murray wants to go i think he would have preferred a, a bigger player not no district Dan, donald or uh, drysdale's a very good player he's an outstanding player and he's an elite puck mover but i think anaheim really wants to go defense so craig would you agree is this pick set up just perfectly at this point where it falls to your lap you take drysdale yeah, I would definitely agree. Uh, Drysdale would be the logical pick here because I do believe that Anaheim was much more predisposed to take a defenseman than a forward. And the two defensemen at the top of this draft are Drysdale and Sanderson. So this one would seem to be a no-brainer for the Ducks. All right, Ducks are on the clock. Time is ticking down. First round, they have two selections. They won later at 27, but their pick here at number six is in as we go back to the commissioner. Uh, Anaheim Ducks Executive Vice President and General Manager Bob Murray 
will make the sixth selection in the 2020 NHL draft. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. The pick is in. 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 Is the pick is in. The pick is in. Woohoo! Uh, with the sixth pick in the 2020 draft, the Anaheim Ducks are proud to select from the Erie Otters, Jamie Drysdale. So the pick is in. As you might have heard, Jamie Drysdale is the selection. Considered a new age defenseman. Got to get someone to frame that camera for the celebration <laughs> shot here. We got some tall people in that room. You got to go up there. Jamie Drysdale, the pick there at number six for the Anaheim Ducks. Fun start here to the 2020 NHL draft begins with Alexi Lafreniere to the New York Rangers. Their fan base is fired up. They capitalized last year at number two. They get Lafreniere at one here. Number two this year to the LA Kings. Quinton Byfield, six foot four, fast, skilled. And then at number three, the German Tim Stutzla to the Senators. Word for seven. Now across the river with the top overall selection, it was the New York Rangers selecting Alexi Lafreniere. Year. Just a few moments ago, he chatted with Jamie Hirsch. Alexi, congratulations. The speculation is over, and you are now a member of the New York Rangers franchise. What was it like to hear your name as the first overall pick of this year's draft? Um, it's a big honor for me. Obviously, Rangers, uh, New York Rangers is a, a big organization with a lot of uh, history and uh, a lot of great players so um, for me it's a big honor and I'm really excited to uh, to join this team. You become the first Quebecois player to be drafted first overall since 2003. What do you think it means to the Quebec community, the hockey community overall to have a Quebecois player drafted first overall? Um, I think it, it means a lot. It means a lot to me. Um, just being able to uh, represent uh, the Quebec, uh, Quebec City, uh, I think it's a uh, Something really, uh, really special for me, and um, I'm really excited to uh, to keep going and um, to try to uh, make them proud again. I know this night was totally different from how you probably imagined draft night when you were a kid, but what will you remember most about tonight? Um, I think just um, throwing on a, a Rangers jersey, it's uh, pretty amazing. Um, you know, growing up, you, you dream of... Uh, uh, being drafted in the NHL and um, you know just being able to uh, have an NHL jersey and uh, especially the uh, New York jersey, it's uh, it's really uh, unreal for me. Congratulations, Alexi! Can't wait to see you on the ice. Thank you. Not exactly how he thought this night would play out. He's at home, but he's still celebrating, going from Quebec to NYC. The first six picks are in. The New Jersey Devils are on the clock. Certainly changes within the organization. New head coach in Lindy Ruff and a new GM, Tom Fitzgerald. He's going to make his first ever pick in the draft here at number seven. Pierre, well, actually, let's go to Bob first. Bob, where do you think he goes with this? Well, I think scoring winger. The, if you look at the way the New Jersey Devils are constructed, they've had Nico Heeshier, they've had uh, Jack Hughes, two number one overall picks, both centers. Uh, they're looking for goal-scoring wingers. Now, could that be Cole Perfetti, who plays center or wing? Now, it could be. Could that also be uh, Holtz, the Swedish winger, who's played in the Swedish men's league for the last couple of years, and Jack Quinn from the Ottawa 67s is another scoring winger on the board. Wow. Paul, Paul Castron's going to help Tommy Fitzgerald make this call. He's a chief scout, and I would say that Bob's spot on something. Alexander Holtz, I think, might be the pick. All right, let's see the Devils take. New Jersey Devils general manager Tom Fitzgerald will make the seventh selection in the 2020 NHL draft. The New Jersey Devils are proud to select from Jurgarden right winger Alexander Holtz. So cheers and hugs there, Alexander Holtz. Remember last year only one Swedish forward actually went in the first round. This year we already have two. I like this. Holtz might be missing that big draft show atmosphere, but 
he might be missing it more than most because this was interesting. He had this to say. He thinks attention is great. He likes the spotlight. He says that it's fun to get so many eyes on him. Devils fans, they can't wait to have him. Newest member of the New Jersey Devils. Craig, who does he remind you? Philip Forsberg of the Nashville Predators. And like Philip Forsberg, he's a hungry goal scorer. He can score on the rush, he can score in tight, and he can score in, up from distance because he has a quick release and a very, very accurate shot. And when you have Jack Hughes, who's an exceptionally creative centerman, and Nico Hischer, a very good two-way complete centerman, you need wingers that can take advantage of their skills and their creativity and their playmaking. Alexander Holtz, regardless if he plays with Hughes or he plays with Hischer, he is going to deliver and be able to make not only those two players that much better, but this is a significant addition to the New Jersey Devils. Holtz has got one of the best shots in of all the players that are in this draft. And, and you talked about the comparable, who you thought he might be like. I know the New Jersey Devils are looking at him and thinking, could this be a David Posternak type of player? The guy that can score 30, money in the bank, playing with those great centers like Heeshear and Jack Hughes. And that's the kind of thing the New Jersey Devils are looking in terms of trying to construct their team. This is a guy who played in the Swedish League against men last year and maybe had a little quicker adaptation than Lucas Raymond. He's a shoot-first guy, but he does have playmaking ability, so he fits in well with what Jersey's trying to do here. No question about it, Bob and Craig and Liam. And I'll tell you one thing, if you think about the New Jersey Devils, last year, Kyle Palmieri led their team in scoring 25 goals. So they clearly need scoring from the wings. They had those two creative centermen that Bob and Craig were talking about, Liam. I think this is a perfect fit for their organization. It's all about team building for the Devils, and this is a good addition to their team building. Yeah, just piece after piece after piece, because let's not forget that this is a team that reached Stanley Cup final back in 2012, lost to L.A. The Devils have missed the playoffs in seven of the last eight seasons. You mentioned Lucas Raymond, his teammate over in Sweden. He was selected at number four. He had this to say about Holtz. He's great. If he gets an opportunity put in the net, he will do it nine times out of ten. This guy's a goal scorer, an amazing shooter. We look ahead, though. The Devils, their pick is in. Buffalo Sabres now on the clock. Three minutes left for them to make their selection at number eight. All right, they've come out. They've said Jack Eichel is not going anywhere, but this is a team in this lengthy postseason drought jack eichel he'd been frustrated impatient that was the number two jack overall eichel. pick obviously right after Connor mcdavid back in 2015 considered a generational talent he's really lived up to it so you're trying to put pieces around jack eichel i don't know if there's anyone out there right now who's going to step in immediately but is there a player out there who's maybe a little bit closer than some of the others uh, i'm telling you they need scoring from the wings and i got to think that jack quinn of the ottawa 67s is somebody that they're thinking about and the reason being he's a guy that's a pure sniper he knows how to finish and he doesn't need a lot of chances to finish craig and bob can tell you that um, he blossomed he's a late bloomer he didn't get burned out he played tier two junior he didn't play until he played major He's a guy that I think is somebody that Buffalo has on their minds. They missed the playoffs the last nine seasons, longest active draft in the NHL. Bob, Craig, you haven't won a playoff series, as you well know, since back in 2007. Craig, where do you think the Sabres go here? Well, they have to get some wing support that can score goals with Jack Eichel and Dylan Cousins, who was their first-round draft pick last year, who's coming, who I believe is ready to play in the National Hockey League. They're both right-shot centers. And when you're trying to take advantage of that strength up the middle of the ice, you need wingers. Just like the New Jersey Devils, you need wingers that can score. Cole Perfetti is a tremendous fit to me as a left winger, playing with smart centermen like Eichel and Cousins. You know, Jack Quinn is a goal scorer. I think he's the best goal scorer in the draft. It'll be interesting what they need to do, but I think the type of player they need is clear. Yeah, yeah. What's become obvious? Go ahead. What's Bob. become obvious here right now is with Cole Perfetti, I'm not a big player, not, not small, necessarily small, but 5'10, 5'11, perhaps. Uh, you've got Marco Rossi at 5'9 uh, from the Ottawa 67s. And uh, both of these guys right now are still very much on the board. They're both offensive threats that can complement uh, the players that the Buffalo Sabres have. But to what Pierre was talking about, a lot of people believe that Jack Quinn might be the premier goal scorer in this draft. Now, 
Paul Perfetti might want to argue with that somewhere along the line, but nevertheless, those are things we'll be watching here in the weeks and months to come. I mentioned Eichel before. He said in May, I'm fed up with the losing. I'm fed up. I'm frustrated. I'm a competitor. I want to win every time I go out on the ice. I want to win the Stanley Cup every time I start a season. We saw a first-time GM make the pick at number seven. We're going to see another make the pick at number nine. Bill Guerin make his first pick with the Wild. And now here at pick eight with the Sabres, Kevin Adams gets to make his first pick at, as GM as we go back to the commissioner. The eighth selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Buffalo Sabres general manager Kevin Adams. We would first like to congratulate the Tampa Bay Lightning on their Stanley Cup championship and also say thank you to everyone at the National Hockey League for all the great work they did under challenging circumstances. The Buffalo Sabres are proud to announce from the Ottawa 67s and the Ontario Hockey League, Jack Quinn. So we wait for the reaction on the delay from Jack Quinn. The suspense. And there it is. The deuce is in. <laughs> Jack Quinn, late bloomer, you'd have to say. Made a massive jump in the past year. Quinn buried 52 goals in 62 games in the OHL last season. Only Nick Robertson, of course, went on to play for the Maple Leafs in the bubble postseason. Had more goals in the OHL last year. So this guy is a legit goal scorer. More importantly for Craig Button, he is his first man crush of the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. I, I love Jack Quinn. And, you know, Bob had talked about Alexander Holtz being like David Pasternak as a comparable. I see David Pasternak as a comparable for Jack Quinn. I think that he's not a one-trick pony when it comes to scoring. He scores in multiple ways, and he scores from multiple spots on the ice, and he also makes big-time plays just like David Pasternak. His coach in Ottawa, Andre Torgny, used him in every single situation. He, even strength, power play, penalty killing, because he's exceptionally smart. And I consider him to be the best goal scorer in this draft, because he can do it in so many ways. And if you want to be a great goal scorer, you have to get to the right spots at the right times. That's exactly what Jack Quinn does. He's a fascinating prospect. It wasn't that many years ago that he was playing double-A hockey, not triple-A hockey, in the Ottawa area. He's very much a late bloomer, somebody that didn't come into the OHL immediately and light it up on a very good Ottawa 67s team. A couple of years ago, he played more of a depth role on a really strong team. It was this one year that he really blossomed. So a lot of the scouts are looking at him and say, is this the real deal or is it fool's gold? It's not fool's gold. We know that he can score the goals, the 52 that he had over the course of the year, but he's also a late birthday. This is a player who only missed being eligible for last year's draft by four days. And can you imagine if he had been eligible for last year's draft? and didn't get to have this 52-goal season, he wouldn't have gone in the first three rounds, perhaps, mm. last year. So what a difference that one year has made. And the Buffalo Sabres, uh, with a, a new scouting staff in place, Jeremiah Crow heading up as their amateur scout under Kevin Adams, have decided, yeah, he's very much the real deal, and we want him as a complimentary goal-scoring player to guys like Jack Eichel. Uh, and now, Eric Stahl. Liam, I'm going to talk about Bob's comment about fool's gold. Aaron Judge was like a 30th round draft pick coming out of high school to the Oakland <laughs> Athletics. Went to school, college, and then became a first round draft pick to the New York Yankees. Just watch how a player plays, watch how he progresses, and then try to project what he can do going forward. Jack Quinn is exactly what Aaron Judge was. He may have a similar impact in being a great goal scorer at the NHL level. Listen, I have a couple young boys, and these are some inspired Inspiring words from Jack Quinn because he said I'm being a late bloomer when I was younger the AAA teams cut me mm -hmm. it's probably the last year AAA that I got cut where I just told myself that they didn't think I was good enough but I knew I was and clearly he was because he goes all the way up at eight to the Buffalo Sabres and you look at team building for this Buffalo Sabres squad that is desperately trying to make it to the postseason and they are really hoping that well, Craig mentioned there that the comparison to David Pasternak is a real one, Pierre. Yeah, there's no question because of the pure scoring ability. And David Pasternak obviously is one of the better scorers in the National Hockey League. And when you talk about, you know, whether Jack Eichel's there or Eric Stahl is there, the biggest thing with Quinn is he knows how to get to the front of the net. He knows just like Pasternak, he'll battle for pucks in scoring areas. He'll make a difference that way. But I, 
again, I can't stress enough, this is a player that never got burnt out playing high-level hockey until he got to Major Junior, and he's taken advantage of his opportunity. You see Pasternak present the target, drive hard in the net, go backhand, forehand, and roof it. I mean, that's just a spectacular play. Here's another example of Quinn. You're going to see him driving wide with speed, get to the inside part of the ice, you know, and put it on your back and put it to the back of the net. That's what pure goal scorers do. So, you know, when you think about it for the Ottawa 67s, they, they're probably thinking about, we want to keep this guy, but they may not be able to. And then what happens with Marco Rossi? Yep. So he might be next going to Minnesota. You never know. I'm, I'm telling you, this could be a big hit for the Ottawa 67s back to back. Well, it could be. Let's let's look ahead because the Minnesota Wild up next. They pick at number nine, but this is a team that's been very busy in the days leading up to the draft. They trade Ryan Donato. They also trade Devin Dubnik, their goalie, to the San Jose Sharks. We don't normally see goaltenders go this high in the draft. Bob, is this a position where we could see a goalie go? You, you want to know something? I, I believe the New Jersey Devils, the Buffalo Sabres, the Minnesota Wild all thought a little bit about Yaroslav Askarov as a potential top 10 pick in this year's draft. But I think there's too many good offensive players on the board where the general managers of those teams are looking at them and saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't jump on the goalie here. I got to go. The Minnesota Wild want a centerman. And they want a centerman who can play sooner rather than later. Now, Cole Perfetti plays center in junior, but a lot of NHL scouts view him as maybe he's going to be a winger. Marco Rossi is the top center on the board. Five foot nine, 185, 190 pounds, a wide body, third, you know, a late birthday, who's probably close to playing in the National Hockey League. He would seem the obvious choice here. Yep, the guy that Pierre mentioned as well, Minnesota. They have the first-round pick here. They have Pittsburgh's first-round pick next year. That was from the Jason Zucker trade. You saw that graphic. Minnesota Wild, lots of moves moving on from certain players who've been there for a while and now adding a new young talent. Let's go to the commissioner. Minnesota Wild Executive Vice President and General Manager Bill Guerin will make the ninth selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. First, I'd like to say hello to all our great Wild fans across the state of hockey in Minnesota. And a second hello to our assistant GM and brother, Tom Curvers, who's watching from home tonight. Now, I'm proud to select with the ninth pick in the 2020 draft from the Ottawa 67s of the OHL, Marco Rossi. So, massive night for Marco Rossi, a uh, massive night for Austrian hockey, just the third Austrian player to be drafted in the first round. And obviously, Pierre, as we were talking about before, pretty big night for the Ottawa 67s back to back here. Yeah, 100%. And, and Marco Rossi merits his selection. Uh, you talked about needing center iceman. No Miko Koivu, no Eric Stahl. They're looking for a center iceman. They just re up Nico Sturm, which is a real good signing for them out of Clarkson University. The biggest thing about Marco Rossi, there's a Johnny Goudreau component to his game. But, but he's he plays with a little bit of bite. He plays with a little bit of edge. He's, he's one of those guys that you love the pace of his game, and I think he's going to be able to make that transition to the NHL. You talk about the pace, the edge. There are only two Austrians currently playing in the NHL. Michael Grabner, a guy with plenty of pace. Michael Roffel is the other. What should the Wild expect out of this pick, Greg? Well, he, he's an excellent playmaker. He understands how to open up opportunities. He's got great patience with the puck. And he can thread the needle. He can make those plays under sticks and through skates. And the other thing about Marco Rossi is that he's really, really comfortable in tight spaces with opponents on his hip, on his shoulder, and he can draw them into him and at the same time understand where the next best opportunity is coming from. I know Pierre sees similarities between uh, Marco Rossi and Johnny Goudreau. I don't see that at all. I see him more along the lines of Nicholas Backstrom. He's much bigger. He might not be as tall as Nicholas Backstrom, but he's sturdy and thick like Nicholas Backstrom. So a well-traveled guy from Austria to the Ottawa 67s, eventually to the Minnesota Wild. But let's be honest, this is a guy who's used to commuting distances <laughs> because born in Austria, Marco played his youth hockey in Switzerland. His father was driving him 170 miles round trip, six days a week to attend practices. His father, Michael, played pro hockey as a defenseman in Austria for 20 years, had this to say. He bought, he bought his car, zero kilometers. Four years, he brought to the mechanic. It had 470,000 kilometers on it. That is dedication 
from Marco Rossi. But, Bob, that is dedication from Michael Rossi as well. <laughs> yes, it most certainly is. Uh, you got to be a crazy hockey dad sometimes and in a really good, crazy sort of way. Rossi's a really fascinating uh, study here. He's five foot nine, but he's not a small player. Uh, 185, 190 pounds. He's got the really big backside, the big legs. Sidney Crosby esque in terms of the low center of gravity, and there's some power to his game. See, so strong on the puck, and you don't often say that a lot about five foot nine hockey players. He's also a late birthday. He just missed being eligible for last year's draft by eight days. Um, you know, the good news is that this guy is really dedicated. His attention to detail is unbelievable. Nutrition, eats like a pro. Uh, conditioning, trains like a pro. Um, every, on the ice, a strong two-way player, dedicated defensive guy, but he averaged more than two points a game to become the first European to win the Ontario Hockey League scoring title. So what's not to like about it? There are some scouts that look at it and say, all that good news is also, is there that much more room for growth? Rossi would say yes. He worked out incredible. His workout regimen this summer, I would dare say, probably was as demanding as any player who's in this draft in terms of the lengths that he went to to get better with his trainer in Switzerland and Austria. Uh, so the question is, though, is there more upside? Because he's an older player, because he's more physically mature, you know, a guy like Cole Perfetti, who's still sitting on the board and has to be going through a real tough time right now, a little more physically immature, not as fast, but there's a lot more growth in Perfetti's game. How much more growth will there be in Rossi's game? Well, Billy Guerin's convinced that he, that he's plenty good as it is right now, but that he's going to continue to get better. And Rossi himself feels like he took enormous strides working out over the course of this summer and getting that much faster, that much stronger, and that much better. All right, so we go from tremendous upside at the top of the draft to a question of upside as we get a little bit further either way marco rossi in there at number nine and we look ahead and now the winnipeg jets on the clock at number 10 and i think a lot of people are eyeing winnipeg because i think they're wondering about a trade leading up to this because a lot of talk about patrick line being shopped do you see patrick line being on this team when they start the season based on all the noise that's around i'd say probably not which is unfortunate, obviously, for the Winnipeg Jet fan base. He's a pure scorer. Everybody knows that. One of the things that I saw when I was in the Edmonton bubble and he was playing for Winnipeg, I didn't see a lot of second and third effort from Patrick Liner. That's something that I think going forward, whether he's in Winnipeg or not, he's going to have to display to his teammates in particular. But obviously, it's high-end offense from him. And if you're not getting that offense and he's not competing, then he's not helping you win. And that's something they need him to get better at if he stays. Yeah, you hey, Liam, if they do, if Lee, Liam, if they do trade... If they do trade Patrick Line, they're going to need even more offense in their lineup. The best offensive player on the board right now, bar none, is Cole Perfetti. And I've got to believe the Winnipeg Jets are dancing at the opportunity of maybe getting a guy that could be an elite offensive player. So I'll be curious to see if they jump on him here or whether the size factor is scaring teams off. But I can't imagine Cole Perfetti not going in the top 10 in this draft. No, I would agree with you 100%, Bob. I think the biggest thing, too, is you got an injury situation with Brian Little that they might have to deal with one way or the other other in Winnipeg so that's a little bit more depth that they don't have but I would say again having spent a lot of time around them in the bubble in Edmonton Cole Perfetti's a fit there and again if you're just, planning ahead go ahead yeah, please go ahead yeah just get good players and Cole Perfetti's a really good player are we going to be sitting here in three four years time talking about Cole Perfetti and how did they get him at 10 you know like Braden Point how did they get him in the third round it makes no sense just get good players Perfetti's I don't think, a good I don't, player that being said I don't think three or four years after they took Patrick Lina we talk about him being possibly traded but we'll <laughs> see here we go number 10 Winnipeg Jets general manager Kevin Sheveldayoff will be making the 10th selection in the 2020 NHL draft. As this coming season marks our 10th year in the history of our franchise in Winnipeg, and tonight we make the 10th overall selection, I would like to invite Crystal Howarchuk, wife of Dale Howarchuk, the greatest number 10 in Winnipeg Jets history, to make our selection. Crystal? Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. But first, our family would like to thank the Winnipeg Jets and all of Dale's loyal fans and friends for their love and support through his very tough fight of stomach cancer. He was a great hockey player and a very special man. I want you to know that he loved Winnipeg and I always felt a special connection to the people of Manitoba. We both consider Winnipeg our home, 
Your love and support meant so much to him. Thank you. Now I am thrilled to announce with the 10th selection in the 2020 NHL draft, the Winnipeg Jets select from Saginaw Spirit, Cole What a great moment there. What a memorable moment for Cole Perfetti. Oh, his father, Power Angelo. Makes the pick. Yeah, that's amazing. His father, Angelo, must be jumping through the building right now. I had the privilege of coaching Cole Perfetti in a lot of youth events uh, when he obviously was a lot younger. And, one of the things that stands out, Craig will probably back me on this, his hockey sense is off the charts. He might be one of the smartest players in this draft, and he makes things happen because of his hockey sense. He really does. Yeah, I'm not backing you, Pierre. I think his hockey sense is better than you're giving him credit for. <laughs> In fact, on a five scale, I give him a six out of five. He reminds me so much of Artemi Panarin and his ability to make the play that is needed and necessary any particular moment in time. Not a lot of flash and dash to Cole Perfetti, but I know this. He finds ways to be productive. He finds ways to be elusive. And when you think about the Winnipeg Jets and the high-end skill they have up front, with Scheifele and Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers. And let's keep in mind that Patrick Laine is still there. All Cole Perfetti does is give him another high-end skilled talent up front. And whether that's at center ice or left wing. One other thing I'll say about Cole, if they want to play him at center ice, what a beautiful situation to play behind Mark Scheifele. That also gives them options. And keep this graphic up here because I want to go to Bob. You know, we talk about the, the World Juniors being a launching pad for a lot of these young men's careers. It, in some ways, for Cole Perfetti, it absolutely was because the chip on his shoulder just got larger and larger. Well, just look at those numbers before getting cut from the World Junior Camp and after. And he turned his season around and really went on a run. And I've got to believe that being ranked to potentially go in the top five in this draft and then not going until number 10 and sitting through all those picks, I'm sure he thought he might be going to the Detroit Red Wings at number four. Um, and, it, you know, there's lots of ties with Detroit. Um, knows Chris Draper extremely well. Uh, Chris Draper's best friend is uh, the Billet family for Cole Perfetti and Saginaw. Uh, Chris Draper's strength coach is Cole Perfetti's strength coach. Tracy Tutton, the Detroit Red Wings power skating instructor, is uh, Perfetti's instructor. But here he is off to the Winnipeg Jets, and uh, he's got to be relieved. Yeah, about that World Junior, he says, it sucks to be cut, but it turned my season around. I used it as motivation. I try to shove it back at people. Cole Perfetti, the pick there. Nashville's on the clock. Bob, all of your top 10 players are already off the board. Are you feeling as confident about your next 10? We'll see. Is brought to you by Gatorade Thirst Quencher, the proven sports fuel of the NHL. All right, 30 seconds left for the National Predators to make their selection at number 11. Bob, is this a possibility? Yaroslav Askarov, the goalie? We're into the goalie zone now. Uh, Yaroslav Askarov, any point here from this point forward could be taken. And if uh, the Nashville Predators don't grab him here at 11, I wouldn't be surprised if some other teams try to trade up to get into the 12 or 13 spot to try and take the goaltender. Final seconds, the Preds on the clock. The pick is in. Let's see who it is. David Poyle, the Nashville Predators President of Hockey Operations and General Manager, will make the 11th selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. The Nashville Predators are very excited to have the 11th pick in this uh, draft, and we're also very excited to have a special person to present uh, our selection. It is uh, Roman Yossi, our captain, and this year's Norris Trophy winner is the best defenseman in the National Hockey League. Nor Roman, if you do the honors for us, please. With the 11th pick in the 2020 NHL Draft, Nashville Predators are proud to select from St. Petersburg, Yaroslav Askarov. Well, we were talking about the goalie. The pick is in. Nothing like bringing a defenseman up to select a goalie. That's the way it should be done. Roman Yossi, Norris Trophy winner. Yaroslav Askarov is the pick. And this is a guy who's considered the best goalie prospect since Carey Price. This is the highest a goalie has been selected in a decade. And Jack Campbell also went 11th overall. Pick is in. Goaltender taken at 11. We don't normally see goalies go this high, as we mentioned, Pierre. He's 
he worthy of this high of a selection? Oh, I think so, absolutely. Craig Button's been talking about him for a while. A lot of people have evaluated Russian hockey, thinks he's probably one of the best goal players ever out of Russia. Obviously, Vasilevsky just winning the Stanley Cup. But the one thing you'll notice about Askarov, he catches with his right hand, not his left hand. Carey Price catches with his left hand, so a little bit of a difference there. Obviously, in Nashville, they're looking for goaltending help. Pekka Rene is obviously not getting any younger, and UC Saros had an opportunity this playoff season, really didn't deliver to the level that the Predators wanted. I can't think it's too far down the road where Yaroslav Askarov isn't playing in the National Hockey League. He's that good a goaltender, Liam. Yep, you see the comparisons to Carey Price. They're considered the best prospect since him. He catches with his right hand, as you mentioned. That's an extreme rarity in today's NHL. 89 goalies to play in an NHL game this season. Only six of them caught righty. He's going to draw comparisons to Carey Price. But you watch him play, Craig, and you think of who? Well, I, I think of Carey Price. That's exactly who I think of. But here's my preamble on Yaroslav Iskarov. Andre Vasilevsky was the 19th pick in the 2012 NHL entry draft. There is no player in that entire draft that has been better than Andre Vasilevsky. There is no player that has even come in close to having the impact that Andre Vasilevsky has had. And we sit here year in, year out and talk about, oh, you can't take a goalie high. Oh, yeah, you can't, can you? You visit a trophy winner, Andre Vasilevsky, Stanley Cup champion, Andre Vasilevsky. And let me tell you this. I don't throw around comparisons to Carey Price lightly. Yaroslav Iskarov is the best goalie entering the draft since Carey Price. Exceptional hockey sense, exceptional ability to maneuver in and around the net, and he's big-time competitive, and he works at it. I think this is a tremendous pick by the Nashville Predators and much needed. This could be a futures pick as well because there could be at least another couple of years in the KHL for Askarov before he comes to the National Hockey League. But we've seen it before. We talked about the Russian factor in past drafts. What did the St. Louis Blues get by drafting of Vladimir Tarasenko when people realized it might be two, three, four years before he comes over? What did the Washington Capitals get uh, by drafting Evgeny Kuznetsov, realizing that it could be two, three, four years before he came over? So whether you have to wait for the player or not, it's immaterial. You want to take the best player available. The Nashville Predators believe that he's the best on the board right now. And to Craig's point, that he can have a major impact. It just may not be right away. Yeah, I want to raise my hand on that too and just quickly say, yeah, they have to wait till those guys came in and help them win Stanley Cups in St. Louis and Washington. <laughs> you know what? I've been around this draft for a long time. The best goalie I saw drafted in 1990 was the 20th pick overall, Marty Brodeur, and this guy's going to have a chance to be in that category. And everybody can talk about Carey Price, who's never won a Stanley Cup, Vasilevsky, who has. I'm just yep. telling you right now, there's a Marty Brodeur component to this player. And that's how good and how much respect I have for the player. Well, pretty incredible. He goes number 11 overall, and we're throwing around names like Price... Rotor, mm -hmm. serious name there, and obviously Andre Vasilevsky just took home the cup. We knew a team that wasn't going to be taking a goalie is the Florida Panthers, and they're up next. They took a goalie high last year, the American Spencer Knight. They're up at number 12, about a minute left here. Bob, I'll go to you. Where do you see Florida going? What direction with this pick? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult read. They're in a team in transition in terms of a new general manager in Bill Zito and the direction they're going to go. I can only look at our best player available, and we've got Anton Lundell, the Finnish center, at number 12. Hmm, do the Florida Panthers have any other Finnish centers in their organization? <laughs> Alexander Barkov. <laughs> and I'm not saying that Lundell is Barkov because he's not, but Lundell is an outstanding two-way center who might be a little bit shy on the high offensive ceiling, but in terms of playing a strong two-way game, and I believe Lundell actually played a game today uh, overseas, so we'll be curious to see whether the Florida Panthers jump in and follow that trend of Finnish players, even though they have a new general manager in Billy Zito. Well, he's close to playing, too. He's ready to play in the yeah, National Hockey so. League, and what a nice situation to play behind Barkov. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%, Craig. The other thing is Billy Zito's tied into Finnish hockey big time. He was an agent, used to represent a lot of coaches that used to go work in Finland, Mike Eves being one of them. All right, we're keying in on a guy here. We'll see if it's Anton Lundell. The pick is in. Bill Zito, the general manager of the Florida Panthers, will make the 12th selection in the 2020 NHL draft. 
On behalf of the Florida Panthers, I'd first like to thank our fans for their support during these difficult times. The Panthers would like to select from IFK Helsinki, centerman Anton Lundell. Celebration on. Past four drafts, there have been six Finnish players drafted top five. You see a lot of top-end talent. Most recently, Capo Paco went second to the New York Rangers last year. Here in the 2020 draft, Anton Lindell, the first Finn selected. He goes to the Florida Panthers at pick number 12. Coming up next, it's the Carolina, excuse me, Carolina Hurricanes. NHL draft, Jake Sanderson, elite defenseman. He goes to the Ottawa Senators at number five. This is a draft where Ottawa is looking to really ignite their franchise. Three picks in the first round, two in the top five. They get Tim Stutzla, a left wing who can score and make plays third overall. And then it is Jake Sanderson, who just a few minutes ago had a chat with Jamie Hirsch. Jake, congratulations. You are the fifth overall pick going to the Ottawa Senators. What was your reaction to finding out that you were taken at number five? No, um, I was just really excited to spend the moment with my brother and both my parents is really special and just super excited and pumped up right now. Yeah, and your dad, Jeff, knows plenty about uh, hockey and being drafted and everything, but uh, what is the biggest thing that he has taught you about whether tonight or your development overall and what to expect going forward? Um, I think from him, probably the biggest thing is just enjoy the moment because you won't be able to um, play hockey forever and he played a really long career so I've definitely got to listen to him on that about that so just enjoy the moment and spend time with your teammates. If and when you make it to the National Hockey League you would become the first Montana born player ever to play in the NHL. What can you tell us about the hockey community you experienced growing up there? Yeah, that'd be really exciting. I think for me growing up in Whitefish, there wasn't a lot of hockey at the time. There was only one team there, so I was playing with kids younger than me and older than me, so that was a little different with that, but we had to travel a lot too, and um, hockey there right now, it's definitely grown, and there's a lot of hockey fans there, and um, you know, hockey's growing there too, so I think everybody's really excited, and so am I. I know they are very excited for you tonight. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. Jake Sanderson, the American, headed to the Ottawa Senators. We look ahead to the Carolina Hurricanes. Fifth straight winning season. This is, let's be honest, under Rod Brindamore, a team that's definitely on the rise. General direction, Craig, that you think they go with this pick here at 13. Well, I know this, what owner Tom Dundon said, is they're not going to draft a defenseman in the first round. Goaltender was taken ahead of them. He wants to be entertained with offense. He said he'd rather lose 5-4 than win 2-1. <laughs> I think they're going forward. <laughs> and I'd rather watch that game, so I agree with them. Let's see who they take here at number 13. The Carolina Hurricanes pick is in. The 13th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Carolina Hurricanes president and general manager, Don Waddell. Carolina Hurricanes are proud to select from the Portland Winter Hawks, Seth Jarvis. Great emotion there, Seth Jarvis selected by Carolina. You think about 2020, Listen, it's not a year that anyone's loving. A lot of people say 2020 sucks. Seth Jarvis, his 2020 got off to a pretty great start, though, because this is a guy through his first 32 games of the season on a good path. He had 15 goals, 20 assists. But the calendar turns to 2020. Jarvis did not disappoint. Final 26 games of the season. 27 goals, 36 assists, 63 points. Bob, you thought this might be a fit, Carolina and Jarvis. Yeah, we knew the Carolina Hurricanes were looking for skill. The knock on Jarvis, and it's not much of a knock, is that he is a sub-six-foot player. He's 5'10", 175 pounds. But the numbers that he put up in the second half of the season, that you just quoted, Liam, I mean, he averaged 2.42 points per game. He's got elite skill, elite sense. A lot of NHL scouts like comparable in terms of style of play to Mitch Marner, who obviously went much higher in the draft than did Jarvis. But this is a player who really was on a rocket ride, especially in the second half. 
of the season. And I knew when we did our consensus ranking back in June and we ranked for number 18, over the course of time, I realized that was probably one that we'd want to have back and that he was, was going to go higher than that and was actually a threat to maybe punch into the top 10, but nevertheless, the 13 for the Carolina Hurricanes, a player that they're just going to let develop with the Portland Winterhawks in the Western Hockey League. No rush, just let him get physically stronger, continue to get his confidence, but there's no doubting the skill or the elite puck handling skills that this kid has. The way I would describe him is slick. He is Mitch Marner slick. He is so good with the puck, and he can strip the puck from you. He's very effective defensively. Doesn't get nearly enough acclaim for all the turnovers that he creates for his team just because of how slick his stick is and how aware he's in all situations. But he is a magician with the puck. Really magical. Team that's stockpiling young offensive talent. Think about some of the guys that lead their club right now. Sebastian Ajo, Tavo Taravainen, and of course, Andre Svechnikov. We saw Ajo last couple of years really blossom into a superstar. Svechnikov really on that path as well. Yeah, guys, you can put the puck in the back of the net and make plays there. Mitch Marner, does that comparison, does that ring true to you, Craig? Uh, well, Mitch Marner's a, a real good comparison, but I, I see Braden Point in Seth Jarvis. And right from the time that they were players in Bantam through midget through their junior years, that's what I see. The, the great cerebral presence on the ice, but they're competitive and determined. They don't allow themselves to be denied. And when you watch them play, yeah, they don't have the physical capabilities yet, but once they do, they become really much more capable and much more confident. Confident. Seth Jarvis is a real top-end player. He can. He's also very versatile. He can kill penalties. He can play on the power play. And when you consider that Andrei Svechnikov, 20 years old, he's an elite goal scorer. You saw 61 points there. That's only going to rock it. When you have a player like Seth Jarvis and get the puck to an elite goal scorer, you're now looking at 50 for Andrei Svechnikov because he has the ability. He now has a player that can do it. And up the middle of the ice, along with Martin Nachash, this is a team that's got some excellent young forwards and highly skilled ones at that. He's 100% right about the forwards. You know what's really interesting about this whole thing with Carolina? Nobody ever talks about their defense. You heard Craig talking about, you know, the owner wants to go high octane, they want to score. They defend really well, and part of that is because of who their coach is, Rod Brindamore, but another part of it is because of the athletes they have on defense. So this is a team that's really starting to skyrocket up. I'm talking about Carolina. They're, well, they're looking good. It's a lot more fun to talk about the tailback than it is the <laughs> offensive line. That's just True. the way it goes. Yeah. This is a, <laughs> it's a young team. It's an exciting team, and it's a team that can absolutely score, and they've been successful. So it looks like it's a team that can potentially make another step forward because they've been right in the mix in the postseason the last few years. We look forward, though, to an Oilers club that we're expecting anticipating to make several steps but of course as they get set to make this pick at 14 some news about their captain and their superstar player Connor McDavid last night the news broke that he tested positive for COVID-19 according to the team he's feeling well he's showing mild symptoms right now but he's voluntarily quarantining at this point so obviously we wish a speedy recovery there to Connor McDavid and now we're just about 60 seconds or so away from the Oilers selecting here at 14. Bob, you have really any angle on where they could go specifically? Well, I can only tell you this. General Manager Kenny Holland in his media run-up to this event suggested that he would be very surprised if he took a defenseman, that they've got a lot of defensemen in the pipeline, uh, Evan Bouchard amongst others, mm. and that it's much more likely that they're going to take a forward. The top forward we've got on the board is Dawson Mercer, mm -hmm. Uh, who plays in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. Good goal scorer, strong two-way game. So I'll be curious to see where they go here. Some people think Lucas Reichel from uh, Germany is a guy that's going to go a lot higher than we have him ranked at number 22. So I, I would think the Oilers are looking for offense here. But boy, Craig, to pass Caden Gooley at this point might be a tough one too. And that's obviously a defenseman that can play a strong two-way game. Team looking for offense, of course, second team in the last 23 seasons with top two scores in the league in Dreisaitl and McDavid. Let's hear the pick. The 14th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Edmonton Oilers president and general manager, Ken Holland. The Edmonton Oilers are proud to select with the 14th pick, Dylan Holloway, University of Wisconsin. 
So as Dylan Holloway waits on the delay here, and we all wait for the reaction, which is coming in momentarily. I can tell you the last year we didn't see a college player selected until round four, and this year Dylan Holloway, as they mentioned, played last season at Wisconsin, goes to the Oilers with pick 14. The only one who doesn't know right now is seemingly <laughs> Dylan Holloway. What's amazing is he's so fast on the ice. It's unbelievable how quick he is. There's a Chris Kreider component to his game in terms of how he gets up and down the ice. Uh, more of a straight line player than an east-west player. Uh, somebody that's got good size and strength and is somebody that uh, I think fits into what Edmonton's trying to do with their attack-oriented type game. Listen, you can't make a virtual NHL draft omelet without breaking a few eggs, guys. There's going to be some bumps in the road. It wasn't going to be super smooth, but we're here. We're bringing you the information, and we're having a little fun along the way. Dylan Holloway, the 14th pick for the Oilers there, and now the Toronto Maple Leafs officially on the clock. So the Toronto Maple Leafs on the clock at number 15, but at number two was Quentin Byfield to the L.A. Kings. Compares well to Andre Kopitar, says Craig Button. Let's hear what he had to say to Jamie Hirsch. Quentin, congratulations. I see a big smile on your face. We saw the reaction of your family, the confetti and all. What was it like for you to hear your name called as a number two overall pick? Yeah, no, it was, it was definitely super, something super crazy. And, um, you know, getting be able to spend that with my family and, I um, mean, you know, all the people that support me growing up was something um, really exciting. I'm um, you know, definitely anxious coming up for that. And, um, you know, hearing my name get called, definitely a big relief off my shoulders. And, um, you know, can't wait to um, go to L.A. now. You are officially the highest selected black player in NHL history at number two. It's a huge honor and distinction. And I'm sure you are going to grow up to be a lot of kids' role models. So what does that distinction mean to you? Yeah, I know that's something, um, you know, super positive and, um, you know, I just want to continue, um, you know, spread positivity and awareness to, um, you know, that subject and, um, you know, it's also just something about my hockey career and, um, you know, it was just an exciting moment for me and um, so, you know, I'm just really happy about that all coming together. Nobody else in your entire family played hockey. You were the one that decided to take a chance and here you are as the number two overall pick. When did you know that hockey was something you loved and wanted to dedicate your life to? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. Um, you know, nobody really um, played hockey in my family, but growing up, uh, I think they, they really enjoyed watching um, hockey and watching the Maple Leafs. My dad's a huge fan. And, um, you know, we really just started watching that uh, every Saturday night and got, got super involved about that. And, um, you know, I think that's how I fell in love with the game. But, um, you know, I never really knew when I was uh, going, to, going to make it to the NHL. But, um, you know, I'm so thankful for this day. Dad might have been a Leafs fan growing up, but I'm sure he is a Kings fan going forward. Congratulations, Quentin. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, and, oh, shout out to my Oma as well. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Grandma on a big night, a history-making night. The highest-drafted black player in the history of the NHL, Evander Kane and Seth Jones, were both selected fourth. Quinton Byfield second to the L.A. Kings. But right now we fix our focus on the Toronto Maple Leafs selecting right here at number 15. Toronto, your five minutes has elapsed and the pick is not in. You can either now make the selection or take a timeout. Are we taking a timeout? You getting them? Okay, they're taking no a With the 15th overall selection in this year's 2020 NHL draft, we are proud to, Toronto Maple Leafs are proud to select from UFA of the KHL, Rodion Amaroff. So Mitch Marner wasn't interested in taking the timeout. He goes out and he makes the pick, <laughs> and we get another player from the KHL. Bob, what well, can you tell us about this selection? Well, he's off to a very good start this season in the uh, Continental Hockey League. He's a player uh, who can really skate and score and, you know, drives the net. Real good shot. And we had him number 19 on our board, and he goes to the Toronto Maple Leafs at number... 15, so not too far off the mark in terms of the, the consensus, Craig. Well, as a left winger, they have Mitch Marner and they have William Nylander on the right side. Obviously, with Matthews and Tavares up the middle of the ice, Rodian now as a left winger is a nice compliment to those players. He's older, as we point out, born after September 15th of 01, playing in the KHL, so closer to playing than not. But he's got the ability to maneuver in tight spaces in and around the net. You don't need him to carry the puck up the ice. Nylander and Marner and Matthews, they can do all that. So it fits a specific area of your team 
that every team wants. Somebody that's really good in front of the net and around the net can find those loose pucks and score. That's exactly what Amirov does. And a year ago, April, at the 2019 Under-18 World Championships, he did have six goals in seven games. Now, it was hard playing in the KHL last season to fully evaluate him. The same sort of thing that happened with Lucas Raymond in the Swedish Hockey League was happening with Amarov. He wasn't getting quality minutes. He wasn't playing a lot. Uh, this season, that's been a little bit different. Starting this season and the fact that some of these European players got a little more exposure because their leagues are going and the Canadian Hockey League and the NCAA is not, well, then there's a little bit more exposure for some of these guys, and I think it helped them a little bit in terms of their ranking. Although, as we said, back in June, we ranked him number 19th overall, and he didn't go far off that to the Leafs' only four spots earlier. I think it addresses a need, too, for the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, you think about Connor Brown moves on to Ottawa. They've lost some players. Nazem Kadri gets traded out of there. They're trying to upgrade, even though people say they have this high array of offensive talent. I think they're trying to add on, and I wouldn't be surprised if they became a very active player going forward on the trade market because they need to address their defense. And you wonder if they need to address things cap-wise, Bob, because you look at some of their top-tier forwards and this graphic up here, and obviously the price tag on all of these guys, Matthews, Tavares, Marner, and Nylander, you start bringing in younger players, but what do you expect in general maneuvering over the next few weeks before we get into the next season here, Bob? Well, it's going to be fascinating to see, but I really believe those four players in particular that you've got up there looking at them, Matthews, Tavares, Marner, and Nylander, I personally would be surprised if the Toronto Maple Leafs make any sort of seismic move to delete one of that core four up front. I think they're looking at doing other deals supplementary, guys like Andreas uh, Johansson, mm -hmm. uh, Johansson rather, um, and some of the other players they've got lower in the lineup. That might not make the financial impact that you want, but I think they're going to nibble around the edges of trying to do that as opposed to going to the heart of the matter. They obviously want to get better on the blue line. They're looking at free agency as a possibility. Alex Petrangelo's name has been mentioned, although I'm not sure that Petrangelo is going to head to his hometown of Toronto as much as he might prefer to stay in the United States. So we'll see what happens on Friday in free agency. But, um, you know, I think the Leafs, I'd be surprised if they didn't return with the core four up front in spite of whatever financial pressures people perceive that might have on the team. I think you look at the draft board right now, pretty interesting. You see 12 forwards. 2D, one goalie selected so far over those first 15 picks. Montreal is up next. The Canadians, team that got into the expanded version of the postseason and then upset Pittsburgh, sent them out. So a little bit of spark for this franchise. Where do they go from here? Craig, if you're the Montreal Canadiens, you're in that draft headquarters. What do you think they are thinking of? Well, of course, everybody in La Belle Provence is talking about Hendrix Lapierre. Oh, boy, the French-Canadian player. I think he's a terrific prospect. But when you consider that there's other players that might be in the forward group that are equally as good or close to Hendrix Lapierre, and the fact that they have Nick Suzuki, they have... Uh, yes, Barry Kotke and Emmy up the middle of the ice. You know, I don't like if you want a good player, I think Hendrix Lapierre is that player. I think he's that good. But this could be a case where they say, hey, we want a little bit of help at a different position. But Hendrix Lapierre, who reminds me in style, style to Patrice Bergeron. You can't go wrong with that type of player, in my view. The one thing you have to pay attention to is Philip Deneau's not happy with his lot in Montreal of being a number three center, potentially. And so that's something the Canadians have to think about long term. Whether or not they take LaPierre with this pick, we certainly have plenty more to talk about with his situation. But right now, it's Montreal Canadiens at 16. Here's the pick. Here's the commissioner. Mark Bergman, Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Montreal Canadiens, will make the 16th selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. Thanks, Gary. Les Canadiens de Montréal sont fiers de sélectionner the Montreal Canadiens select from the Western Hockey League Prince Albert Raiders, Caden Gooley. Caden Gooley, the pick, considered... Best player out of the WA, WHL, the younger brother of Ducks defenseman Brendan Gooley. He is the third defenseman taken here in the 2020 draft. He goes to the Montreal Canadiens there at number 16. 
And coming up, we look ahead. Chicago Blackhawks, they are on the clock at number 17. We'll have their pick. We'll have to look at him and think this is one of the most fascinating but challenging prospects to fully evaluate. The talents there, it's clear. The injury history, that's really not the case, though. Yeah, very much a medical wild card. Now, back in the 18-19 season, he had his first concussion in the Quebec League, missed nine games. That following summer, he was lights out good at the Ivan Olinka tournament. He was projected as a top 10 pick for this year's draft. But in October, he had a concussion, a second concussion, missed four games. In November, he had a third concussion. That shut him down for the season. He was having symptoms. He couldn't seem to get over those. He met with Dr. Dan Dyrek, who's treated David Ortiz, Patrice Bergeron, and Larry Bird, amongst others, in Boston as an athletic therapist. And he was diagnosed with cranial, cerv cervical cranial traumatic injury. Now, that's a fancy way of saying a head and neck injury. The narrative is, you know what? He maybe didn't have concussions. He had a problem between his vertebrae C1 and C2. They got it fixed up with some treatments. He was cleared to play. And this past weekend, in the beginning of the Quebec League season, he was lights out good. Three goals, five points in his first two games. There were 40 scouts looking at him from all over the National Hockey League. A lot of teams weren't able to put medical hands on him because of no combine and because of COVID. And as a result, there are a lot of teams that are scared to jump in without their own medical analysis. But he's a pretty good player who's off to a great start. And the question for me is, does he go in the first round? And if so, where and when? Awesome to see him back on the ice. Bottom line this for me, Craig, if injuries weren't an issue, is he the best player left? Absolutely, in my view. And listen, I think if he didn't have injuries and he was able to show over the course of the season what he showed in the last two games in Shakutami on October 2nd and October 4th, he would have been in consideration in the top five picks. That's how good he is. He was a dominant player in his age group at the Linka Gretzky tournament last August. Dominant. Plays every single area of the game and he plays it well. I think whoever gets him at this point is getting a gem. Pierre, you look at the Chicago Blackhawks. Obviously, LaPierre, a possibility. In terms of best available or position, where do you think they go? Uh, best available? I, I, or think, I think you got to go best available. And if, as long as the medical reports are good, you got to be thinking about LaPierre. You just have to be. Well, we'll see what the Chicago Blackhawks are thinking shortly. Time ticking down. Their pick is in here at number 17. We go back to New Jersey and join Commissioner Gary Bettman. Stan Bowman, Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Chicago Blackhawks, will be making the 17th selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. Thank you, Gary. Here at the Blackhawks, we believe that what we do off the ice is just as important as what we do on it. We have a special guest joining us today to make our first choice from the Fifth Third Arena here on Chicago's West Side. Please welcome one of the inaugural One West Side grant recipients, Jamil Cannon. Jamil is the founder and executive director of The Block, which is a nonprofit boxing program that uses the love of boxing to provide mentorship and academic support to the youth of Chicago. With the 17th pick in the 2020 NHL Draft, from Ice Baron Berlin, the Chicago Blackhawks select Lucas Reichel. So the Blackhawks, they take Lucas Reichel, and remember we talked about the possibility of a very big night for German hockey here, and Tim Stutzler, he goes third overall to the Ottawa Senators, and now it's Lucas Reichel with the 17th selection to the Chicago Blackhawks. Could see another German player taken in the first round as well, but let's focus first on Lucas Reichel. Chicago Blackhawks looking to get back up there and be a truly competitive team. They obviously got into the expanded postseason this year, but Craig, what do they get in this pick? A really good two-way winger, and he's able to score goals. He's competitive around the net. 
but he's also a really good, strong playmaker. I don't see him as a top-line player, but I see him as the type of player who can be critical to a team's success. And when you can play in multiple areas of the game and understand how to take advantage of what is confronting you, he did it in the DEL as a pro. And that is the other unique thing about Lucas. It's not a player that is doing this in junior. He's already shown a significant capability of playing at the professional level. And if the name sounds familiar, it obviously is because he's the nephew of Robert Reichel, former National Hockey League player. So yeah, the Chicago Blackhawks going for a good two-way threat that showed in his peer group to have some decent offensive ability and uh, was pretty uh, fun to watch at the World Junior Championship. And, and Liam, Robert Reichel broke Canada's hearts in the 1998 Olympics when he scored the only shootout goal against Patrick Waugh the first time the Olympians, the NHLers, were at the Olympics. So there you have Lucas, Rod, Lucas Reichel's uncle, Robert. You can cheer for him against Canada. <laughs> uh, another reason for Chicago Blackhawks to be excited about this pick right there. So Reichel the pick there for the Chicago Blackhawks at 17. As for the New Jersey Devils, they're on the clock right now. The Senators, three picks in the first round. The Devils, three picks in the first round as well. They pick here at 18. They're going to pick at 20. And earlier tonight, they selected Alexander Holtz. And moments ago, he chatted with Jamie. Congratulations on becoming a member of the New Jersey Devils. What was your reaction to finding out that you had been drafted number seven overall? It was awesome. Uh, it's a dream come true, uh, obviously. Um, it's so great to be a part of the New Jersey Devils organization, and I'm really looking forward to for it. I know you have a very special relationship with your older brother, David. What has he meant to you, and how has he affected your development? It's been, it's been there for me all the time uh, since I was little and we skating in the outer rink. Uh, he's been there all the time uh, pushing me. Uh, he wants me to get better all the time. Uh, he's a perfect brother. Uh, I love him. So uh, I think uh, if I didn't have him, maybe I wouldn't be here today. Well, I know it is late there in Sweden, almost 2 a.m. So thanks for staying up late and uh, can't wait to talk to you and see you on the ice soon. Thank you, thank you. So we look at New Jersey Devils here picking at 18, picking at 20 again. So how the Devils got this pick, remember they received that first round pick. This was a big part of the Taylor Hall trade. The Coyotes got Taylor Hall, they got Blake Spears. So Hall, former MVP, went to Arizona. The Devils get a pick here. So two picks in the next three. How did the Devils attack this, Bob? Well, if you look at the best available, you can see that Dawson Mercer, who plays in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, is available. He'd be a good pick here. I mean, he's not the fastest skater in the world, but he's a very versatile player. Can play left wing, can play center, can play right wing. He can play on your power play. He can play on your penalty kill. He plays a hard game. He's not afraid to mix it up. Played as a depth role on Team Canada at the World Junior Championship. So, for me, he's a guy that's played three years. He's a late birthday, 2001. He's played three years in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, so he may be a little further along in his development, but just a good, honest hockey player. And if that's what you're looking for here, um, he'd be the logical choice for me. Pierre, new head coach, Lindy Ruff, what type of players do you think he's looking he for? He likes guys with bite. He likes guys that are really smart and compete hard. But, you know, Dawson Mercer reminds me of a player that used to play for Ottawa and Nashville. He's married to a famous country singer, Mike Fisher to Carrie Underwood. Dawson Mercer's got a lot of those same components to his game. He's a fearless player. He plays a robust style, knows how to manufacture some offense, but he's a character type player. Uh, under a minute remaining here. Devils on the clock at 18. Craig, way in here. You have the New Jersey Devils. They already made that pick, obviously, earlier. They take Alexander Holtz at seven. You see them adding what here? Well, you know, we talk about Dawson Mercer. You, you, we go back to Jack Hughes and Nico Hischer as centermen. So you're trying to find more offense on the wings. They already have Holtz. Dawson Mercer reminds me a lot in his approach to the game of Blake Wheeler. He also gives you versatility with the in respect to he can play center ice, so you're never short. We've seen how valuable Blake Wheeler has been to the Winnipeg Jets. Dawson Mercer has a similar type game to Blake Wheeler. He's here, Hughes, and now adding some more young talent here at 18. 
The 18th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by New Jersey Devils general manager Tom Fitzgerald. Thank you. The New Jersey Devils are proud to select from Chicoutimi Center, Dawson Mercer. So Dawson Mercer, we were just talking about him. Going to turn 19 in just a few weeks. Now a member of the New Jersey Devils. But guys, here's a player who already knows the business end of hockey. He was traded last year while in the mm -hmm. Quebec Major Junior League, Bob. Yeah, not unusual. The teams like to load up at the, the deadline in the playoff for the playoff run, and he was obviously a real good player for Canada at the World Junior Championship. So, uh, as I said, a really honest hockey player. He's got some offensive upside. Here's the thing that sometimes works against players like Dawson Mercer in the draft. If you're looking for an absolute home run ball, someone that's going to play on your first line or your even your second line, the, he, he scores goals in the Quebec League, but will it translate to top six in the National Hockey League? Maybe not, but is he a good, honest player who can play in your middle six? Yeah, much more likely. And anybody that has seen the play come from away, which is about 9-11 and everybody landing in Newfoundland, how they took took care of everybody. Dawson Mercer is from Newfoundland, so, you know, everybody loves the Newfoundlanders, and Dawson Mercer on the ice is as likable as he is off the ice. And when I talk about Blake Wheeler, that ability to play with high-end players, to be a driving force, to be a competitive force, is really significant. And the New Jersey Devils are not just looking to add skill, they're also looking to have high-end competitiveness. Tommy Fitzgerald was a dyed-in-the-wool competitor. You know that he's selecting players that resemble those qualities. Yeah, that's why I brought up the Mike Fisher component, because there's a Mike Fisher component to how he plays. I don't think he's got Blake Wheeler's speed, but he's got a lot of the same flexibility things that Blake Wheeler has in terms of being able to play center or play wing. But this is a high-character player, and everybody that you talk to or any tape that you watch will tell you the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting. So many players here, obviously, when we ask them who their favorite players are, Patrick Kane, Patrick Kane. And why wouldn't you say that? Who wouldn't <laughs> want to play that way with the puck on your stick? But when a guy tells you that he looks up to Patrice Bergeron, maybe he won't be Patrice Bergeron, but that's the guy he looks up to, looking for an honest player who's going to get it done. Maybe that's your guy. And you look at the Devils here in the state of the franchise, last in the Metropolitan Competitive Division, but the idea that they missed the playoffs in seven of the last eight seasons, zero playoff series wins since 2012. And, of course, that's when they went to the Stanley Cup final. And the three picks here tonight, they pick seven. They pick 18th. As we look ahead to 20th, the third pick. I don't know. I mean, you look at the way New Jersey's building its team right now, Craig. What does it tell you about how they want to play in the future? Well, you, 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 the key word there, Liam, is building. And it takes a lot of different players to build your team. And so you got elite talent in Jack Hughes and Nico Hischer. Now you need complementary players that can take advantage of them. And that's what becomes paramount. Jack Hughes, in my mind, there's no doubt he's going to be a star player in the NHL. And now you need somebody that can take advantage of those tremendous skills. Same with Nico Hischer. They drafted Ty Smith, who is a really, really cerebral competitive defenseman. They trade for Kevin Ball, who's a big horse of a defenseman. Now you have Holtz. Now you have Mercer. You have another opportunity at 20. They have some good players deeper down in their roster, but now you're building that top end of the roster. And if you don't have the top end, it doesn't matter what you do with the rest of the roster. And Tommy Fitzgerald recognizes that after a long, successful tenor in Pittsburgh, he's trying to do some of the same similar things with the New Jersey Devils. All right, so about two minutes until the Calgary Flames have to make their pick, and then it's the Devils again. You know, we get to this point in the draft, I'm asking what these teams are looking for, who they might be targeting, but just an open question, Bob. At this point in the draft, when you're 19, 20, and beyond, for the next 15 to 20 picks, how much separation are there from a player who's selected here at 19 and a player who might be selected at 40? Not a lot, and it really varies a lot from team to team. So what you're going to see happening now at this point of the draft is that some of the players that we have ranked outside the top 31 – they're, they're going to start going here because to that point that you just made, Liam, it, there may be a team that looks at some guy that's ranked 32 or 35 or 39 on our list 
and thinks that he's 16 or 19 or 21, and that's where you're going to start to see things get a little more scattershot, and there's going to be a little less consensus from this point on. I might start with Calgary here. Well, that's well, my way Liam. of preemptively bailing you out if your list is not correct. I just thought well, I'd put that out that's there. That's what I'm here for. Exactly. But, but I am curious. I mean, do you anticipate trades at this point in the draft if there's that much, if there is not much separation? Probably not, I would oh. say. If I mean, we had one trade last year in the, the, the reflected draft picks, Arizona moving up to 11 with Philadelphia. We've had none to this point. Yep. And it seems to me that everybody's settling into the draft or getting the players they want. One other thing I would add to Bob's commentary is that if you don't take players rated outside of the top 31 or players that we don't think are going to the top 31, how can a team come up and say, we can't believe they were there? Now, there might be a potential for trade here. We'll have to see what's going on here. Oh. Calgary Flames potentially trading this pick. All right. Less than 10 seconds away. We'll see if we get our first trade here in the 2020 draft as we go back to the commissioner. I'd like to announce a trade. Uh, the Calgary Flames are trading pick number 19 in this year's draft, the 2020 draft to the New York Rangers for selections number 22 and 72 in this year's draft, the 2020 draft. So it's Calgary trades 19 in this year's draft to the Rangers for selections 22 and 72 in the 2020 draft. As a result, New York Rangers, you're now on the clock. So essentially, the Rangers trade the third round pick to move up three spots. They made us wait a while, guys, but we got our first trade here. 2020 NHL draft. He puts on the Rangers jersey, the Rangers hat, and it's uh, welcome to Broadway. The world's most famous welcome sign to their new French kid. Rod Gilbert did that. I know he did. <laughs> And this is just a start, because Times Square, there he is, <laughs> larger than life, Alexi Lafreniere, the number one pick in the NHL draft. He's going to call Madison Square Garden home, the newest member of the New York Rangers, a team on the rise. They picked number two last year. Capococco was their selection, and they get number one pick this year. Lafreniere is the man they traded up here, they traded a third-round pick to move up three spots here in the first round, traded with the Calgary Flames. The Flames now down at 22. The Rangers on the clock right now at 19. The pick is in as we go right back to the commissioner. Uh, New York Rangers general manager Jeff Gordon uh, with the second pick in the first round for the Rangers will be selecting the 19th pick. With the 19th pick from the Brandon Wheat Kings, the New York Rangers select Braden Schneider. So another defenseman off the board. Remember, this pick originated with the Rangers trading Brady Shea to the Hurricanes and getting that pick, and then they trade up, and they add a defenseman here, Craig. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because I don't think the Rangers fans are going to like him, and I don't think David Quinn's going to like him because he's really competitive, and he plays physical, and he plays hard, and he makes life <laughs> miserable for opponents, and he's no fun to play against. And let me tell you this about Brady Schneider. All he has done in his three years in the Western Hockey League is continuously improve. He's improved his entire game, his skating, his puck play, and let me tell you this, if you want to get space against Braden Schneider, good luck because he's not giving it up easily. He's after you at every moment in the game and he will jump into the attack. When you watch a player that was raw at 15, 16 years of age and you watch how much he's progressed <laughs> to this point in time, I'll tell you what, it's pretty impressive. He's reminded me of Jacob Truba and his approach to playing. Oh, well, he gets to play alongside Jacob Truba in time. He's uh, yet another late birthday. We've had a lot of these in the draft so far. Uh, five days away from being eligible for last year's draft. So he turned 18 on September 20th in 2001. And he is that right-handed right hand, right shutdown D. He can be a power play shooter on a second power play, but he's primarily a guy, as Craig said, that uh, gets in your face and is hard to play against. Yeah, there's a whole lot of nasty there. He's an old-school player. You know, if you're a Ranger fan, you think about Jeff Bukaboom and what he was doing in his prime with the Stanley Cup winning Rangers. And there's a little bit of that, that old-school nasty in your face, I'm going to grind you into the ground kind of a player. And that's what Braden Schneider is. 
You wonder if David Quinn might like him. I think he might. What about Madison <laughs> Square Garden fans? I mean, you get Alexi Lafreniere, you get the flair, the panage, the scoring ability. And then you see that video right there of Braden Schneider just checking people, wrecking people, giving them no space, and then the tongue out celebration. Oh. I have a feeling, Craig, that the Garden Faithful may enjoy his play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, I follow along with you there. And, you know, one of the things David Quinn really impressed upon people after they got knocked out of the qualifying round was they had to become harder to play against. They had to learn how to be harder to play against, much like the Tampa Bay Lightning, and they wanted some more players like that. Well, guess what? Lafreniere, hard to play against. Braden Schneider, hard to play against. And let me tell you this. There's no game that intimidates e either one of those two players. No, he doesn't look like it. He's a big guy. He's no. over 6'2", over 200 pounds. So another defenseman off the board. The Rangers moved up. They obviously wanted a defenseman. They move up three spots. They pick one. And now again, the New Jersey Devils back on the clock. And this is the Devils' third pick here in the first round. They obviously selected just two picks ago. Here's what the Devils have done so far. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, so this is Alexander Holtz, the seventh overall pick. We remember that forward and then Dawson Mercer the 18th selection so now 20th overall Pierre is there a player that you at this point just would recommend that this is a guy that you see you'd be interested in if you were in that spot for the Devils yeah. you'd like to take yeah, well, I like LaPierre, but I mean, I don't yep. know what the medical records are saying, and maybe people are privy to things that you and I and Bob and Craig aren't privy to, but that's the player that I would like to see go to New Jersey. Well, one of the things, one of the theories we had going into this draft was if there was a team that was going to gamble uh, on LaPierre in the first round, maybe it would be a team that had multiple first-round picks. Well, here we are yeah. with the New Jersey Devils picking for the third time in the first round, but I still don't think that necessarily guarantees you're either comfortable with LaPierre's situation or you're not. And a lot of the teams I talked to simply weren't comfortable, even though he's off to a great start and even though he looked like a top 10 guy a couple of summers ago. It's difficult in this time, if you're a National Hockey League general manager, to draft a player that has question marks medically, especially as it involves your head and your neck, and you don't get your team doctor to be able to lay hands on him and have an actual physical examination. And that's been one of the real downsides for LaPierre going into this draft. If there had been a combine, if there hadn't been a pandemic, then a lot of teams would have been able to bring this guy in and really mm -hmm. drill down medically, and teams would have had a much better handle on what his condition is or isn't. Well, and you think about Tua, who went to the Miami Dolphins. Yep. They had that opportunity to evaluate him with their doctors, with their strength and conditioning people, and that is another byproduct of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic, is that the teams couldn't get with him with their medical staff and their strength and conditioning people to do a full evaluation that gives them the confidence to be able to say, that's our guy. It's got to be at least somewhat reassuring that he's back on the ice and people see him play and that the fact that he was excelling on the ice the other day, but I understand what you're saying, and it's got to be taken into consideration. But Bobby did mention the teams with the multiple picks in the first round. You would figure if someone is going to take him, it would be one of those teams that feel, feels like maybe they could take at least a slight risk because they had other first-round picks. The Devils, one of those teams, three picks in the first round. They're coming up on their final one here. And, of course, you have the Ottawa Senators, a team that picked twice in the first round five picks they take tim stutzler with the third overall pick and then of course at number five they took jake sanderson and ottawa center is going to pick again at number 28 as we still wait here hendricks lapierre still available we'll see if the new jersey devils will scoop him up here at number 20. still waiting on the devils as always the counts they're not always exact not always precise but close enough when we go to the commission the 20th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by New Jersey Devils general manager Tom Fitzgerald. The New Jersey Devils are proud to select from UFA defenseman Shakir Mukamadoulin. So we were having the conversation earlier about prospects between, at this point, 20 and, say, 40, 45. Is there much, much separation, Bob? You mentioned there really wasn't at this point. And Shakir Mukhamadoulin is the selection here for the New Jersey Devils, their final, their third and final pick in the first round. Craig, 
What can you tell us about this pick? Well, he reminds me a lot of Nikita Zadorov and the big range, the skating ability, the opportunity to get in and make plays with the puck. He can do that. And this 2002 born Russian team is one of the very best national teams under 20, under 18, under 17 that I've ever seen. But Mohamedoulin, he can play physical. He's very, very adept at closing down the play in the defensive zone. And you want to have players that are hard to play against. Kevin Ball, who's a real big, strong, sturdy defenseman who they acquired in the Taylor Hall trade, is that type of player. And McCall Madulin is exactly that type of player. The other thing, Bob talked about Braden Schneider as maybe having the ability to be a second power play type shooter from the point. Muhammad Doolin is that type of player also with a big shot. So much change right now with the New Jersey Devils. New head coach in Lindy Ruff. New general manager in Tom Fitzgerald. Three picks here in the first round. It began with Alexander Holtz. We just saw Shakir Mukamadoulin taken at the 20th spot. But right before that, two picks earlier at 18, it was Dawson Mercer. We just chatted with Jamie. Hi, Dawson. Congratulations on going to the New Jersey Devils. Uh, what is it about the Devils in the midst of a rebuild that has you excited that you could go on to this team and potentially make an immediate impact? Yeah, I think it's a really good you know, it's been a great opportunity and a moment for me, and I have a, uh, been so much joy and happiness right now. But I think, like you said, they're in a rebuild, and they have a lot of young, talented prospects coming up through. So I'm happy to be within that group, and like you said, to make an impact uh, pretty soon. Just you know, the you know, try to make that push with a young group of guys to you know build for the future. You won the gold medal at this year's World Juniors, and of course, one of your teammates was tonight's number one overall pick, Alexi Lafreniere, but he went to the Rangers, and I don't know, but I'm pretty sure you know all about a rivalry between the Devils and Rangers. What do you expect that relationship to be like going forward? Yeah, I think he's talented, really talented. Uh, he's shown it all year, all of his life, and I think, like you said, that little rivalry between the, the Rangers and the Devils, I think for sure it'll be nice seeing him out there. Uh, in the future, I'm, uh, you know, there's a lot more work to be done, and I'm excited to hop on the journey. We can't wait to see you suit up for the Devils one day. Thanks so much for the time. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. So we look at the Columbus Blue Jackets on the clock here. It's number 21. Not a lot of trades, not a lot of deals today during the draft, but earlier today, the Columbus Blue Jackets were involved in a pretty significant one because they acquired Max Domi in a third-round pick, 78th overall from the Montreal Canadiens. They send forward Josh Anderson. Pierre, is this fit for both teams? Oh, for Montreal, it absolutely fits. Josh Anderson's a big power forward that they desperately need coming over, for obviously, from Columbus. Before that, the London Knights. So they're very well, well aware of what Josh Anderson can bring. It's not the first time Montreal tried to get him. For Max Domi, it's pretty simple. He fancies himself as a center. He wasn't going to be a top three center in Montreal. But in Columbus, he's going to play right behind Pierre-Luc Dubois and a little bit ahead of uh, Boone Jenner. So it does fit very well for Columbus as well. Plus, Columbus gets a third-round pick for Montreal. So when you put it all together, it's one of those hockey deals that makes sense for both teams because it identifies need. For Montreal, they needed to get bigger. They needed to get that power forward presence they've got it for Max Domi he gets to play in a, probably a top two forward situation preferably at center where he belongs yeah, I, I clearly see Max Domi as a second-line center, and that opportunity vanished with the emergence of Nick Suzuki and Jesperi Kotkaniemi in Montreal. So as Pierre points out about a hockey deal, it's significant, and I clearly see Max as a centerman. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to put him on the wing in Montreal, it was a, a, a square peg in a round hole. And in Columbus, they get their second-line center. No question in my mind, Max can be a really good, solid second-line center behind Pierre Dubois. Last season was the fifth season under John Tortorella. This is interesting because first 15 seasons of the franchise, Columbus Blue Jackets had two playoff appearances. You look at the last four seasons, four playoff appearances, and they've made a mark. John Tortorella and Domi, is that a fit for you, Bob <laughs> McKenzie? Well, it'll be fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> You're All talking tie, right, right? Coming in on the pick, Columbus at 21. We talked about the trade. Now their newest player in their organization. The 21st selection in the 2020 NHL draft, 
will be made by Columbus Blue Jackets general manager Jarmo Kekalainen. The Columbus Blue Jackets are proud to select from avant-garde Omsk of the Continental Hockey League, Yegor Chinakov. Can you call the selection here? First reaction from you, Craig? He's a goal scorer, and he knows how, he knows his way around the offensive zone. You know, Bob just talked about players that benefited from playing. Well, Chinnikov is that player that benefited from playing in the KHL earlier this year. But if you go back and watch what he did in the MHL last year, which is the Russian Junior League, he dominated it. He's matured, he's developed further, and with it has come significant goal scoring. So Columbus gets their pick in. Calgary now on the clock. Of course, they traded down with the Rangers. The Rangers were up at 19. They selected Braden Schneider. And now we will see who the Flames pick. That's coming up right after. At the top, it was a run of forwards. Four straight, but then a pair of defensemen. First, Jake Sanderson, the American. Then this guy, Jamie Drysdale, the second defenseman taken in the NHL draft. He goes to Anaheim, and he chatted with Jamie Hirsch. Jamie, we spoke earlier you about the balloons your mom had well it looked like quite the party lots of people there to celebrate your accomplishment as the sixth overall pick in this year's draft what was that moment like for you oh it was you can't even put it into words it was just so amazing having all these people here my friends and uh, my family so you know just to have the ability to uh, celebrate with them and have my name called is is, is uh, second to none so it's it's a really good time right now yeah, we know your family has been such a huge part of your development, and especially during this pandemic where you haven't been able to have access to so many things that you normally would. Tell us about what your parents did and what you were able to do to stay on top of your game by using your home as a gym. Uh, well, I think that, uh, there's some uh, yeah, well, you know, I uh, started quarantine. My parents uh, kind of took the living room apart and threw some weights and, and a bench and, uh, you know, threw a little gym in there so I could uh, stay fit. So, you know, obviously appreciate that, giving up the living uh, living room for me. So, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, things you got to do. And, uh, you know, um, I'm really, really grateful for having them. I'm sure they will say it is well worth any marks on the carpet or stains on the wall. Congratulations, Jamie. Good luck going forward. Thank you. Appreciate it. Jamie Drysdale, the newest member of the Ducks organization, but now it's the Calgary Flames. They're on the clock. Remember, they were at 19. They traded down. The Rangers traded up. They gave him a third-round pick. They went and selected Braden Schneider with that pick at 19. Then it was the Devils pick, and then Columbus, and now back to Calgary. Before we get to Calgary and their situation right now, I want to go back to pick 21, Bob, because we got a first here on draft coverage on NBC with our group. That's right. Uh, Chinikov went to the Columbus Blue Jackets, and he was the 30th player on NHL Central Scouting's European list. That's well down. But for the first time since we've been doing the draft and using our rankings here on NBC, uh, he wasn't in our top 93. Now, that doesn't make him a bad pick. Uh, I firmly believe that if you like somebody, you just take them and you don't worry about what the other teams are thinking about. And obviously, Yarmo Kekalainen, who's got a very good sterling draft record for finding talent, uh, was more than happy to jump up and take Chinakov in the first round, 21st overall. But as I said, I had to quickly scanned our top 93 and our seven honorable mentions to round it out to 100, <laughs> and he wasn't there. Of the 10 scouts we surveyed, uh, National Hockey League scouts we surveyed, to get these rankings, uh, one of the 10 players had him as a second round pick. Uh, nobody had him in the first. Yeah, I mean, you know, Liam, I I've been watching him since, you know, he's an old one born. He's already gone through a draft. So you, you watch him with his, with his group, his national team group at that age, and he goes through a draft. But then he continuously got better, and you were, he was clearly on the radar. And the benefit of these players playing in the KHL is you had an opportunity to watch him. The difficulty, unlike the scouts that were up in Shikurimi on Friday and Saturday at the beginning of or Friday and Sunday, they weren't able, they're not able, the key decision makers weren't able to go to Russia. But watching the games, and I had that opportunity to do it, you could see that he had clearly progressed in his game. And Yarmo Kekalainen, 
clearly happy and satisfied that he was a player they were they were going to select. It does not make it a bad pick. I agree with you. It does make it a reach, and you'd have to wonder why they wouldn't simply trade down and then take him later. As for Calgary's situation, let's get some clarity here from the commissioner. We have a trade to announce. Uh, the Calgary Flames are trading the 22nd selection in the 2020 draft to the Washington Capitals for selections number 24 and 80 in this year's draft, the 2020 draft. So Calgary tra trades 22 to Washington for 24 and 80, all in this year's draft. Washington, you're on the clock. So the Caps are on the clock. Calgary, to recap, has moved down five spots, and they have acquired two fifth-round picks. They were at 19, then at 22. Now they're at 24. 22's next. Gatorade Thirst Quencher, the proven sports fuel of the NHL. So Washington Capitals on the clock. They trade up here to number 22. Remember, they won the Cup in 2018, but two straight losses in the first round of the playoffs since then. Some new faces, obviously a new head coach in Peter Laviolette. Liam, do yep. it. Take Henrik LaPierre. Well, do it, Liam. You would think of a team as moving up to this spot at this point. They're do it, doing it for a specific reason and a specific pick. We'll see if that's the case right now. The 22nd selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Washington Capitals Executive Vice President and General Manager Brian McClellan. With the 22nd pick, the Washington Capitals are proud to select Hendrix Lapierre. As they say in French, felicitations, congratulations, well done. Uh, that's Stephen Bowman and, and uh, Ross Mahoney, their chief scouts really getting to work and obviously doing a little extra due diligence. I've heard Craig talk about it, Bob talk about it. He had an amazing Holinka tournament in the summer. He has a ton of personality. He's an electrifying type person. He's obviously off to a great year and good on the Washington Capitals and good on that scouting staff in Washington to recognize how talented this player is. Yeah, Bob, Craig, we watch these celebrations time after time, and, it's, you know, listen, they can blend into each other, but this is different. This is a different level of emotion. This is a yeah. sense of relief. you got to believe for Hendrix LaPierre. Yeah, huge. The kid, is, the kid has gone through a, a difficult last year and change. Um, if you haven't been following the show all along, we deemed him the number one wild card in the first round because of his medical history. Uh, in the summer of 2019, this guy was perceived to be a top 10 talent, playmaking, elite playmaking ability, strong two-way game. He sustained a concussion in the 18-19 season, and he missed nine games. That was no big deal. That happens. Well, um, but the following summer, he looked great at the Lincoln Tournament. Second on Team Canada in points behind only Cole Perfetti. But then he got off to a very slow start in October of 2019, and he suffered back-to-back -back concussions in the space of a month. So keep in mind here, in, in, in nine calendar months, he had three head and neck traumas, and the third one shut him down for the balance of the 2019-20 season. The symptoms weren't going away, so we went to see Dr. Dan Dyrick in Boston. Dr. Dan Dyrick is an athletic therapist who's worked with Larry Bird, Patrice Bergeron, David Ortiz, and others. They came up with a diagnosis that it wasn't just concussions, that it was cranial, cervical, traumatic injury, and that there were some problems with his vertebrae that were dealt with when a, uh, Dr. Max Gauthier in Montreal gave him six treatments in the spring. This player was cleared in April to come back and play. There was nowhere to play, obviously. He's trained all summer. He believes he's a healthy player. And he came back in the first two games of the Quebec League season this past weekend, and he scored two goals and two assists in his first game, one of them into an empty net, and scored one goal in his second game. There were 40 NHL scouts in Shakutami to see him do this, to put on that offensive display. And yet, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, NHL teams did, were not allowed to have their own doctors examine this kid. And so for a lot of teams, it scared them off, not the Washington Capitals. They decided at this stage of the draft, they're taking somebody who's got elite playmaking ability and plays a really good 200-foot all-around game that they'll take the chance on him and see where it goes from here. But a lot of teams simply weren't prepared to do that without their doctors being able to 
personally examine him and get their own medical evaluations as opposed to taking those from the guys that treated him. Well, they have to be satisfied with the medical report to take him, but it's eerily similar to when Evgeny Kuznetsov fell to the Washington Capitals because of the so-called Russian factor. Just another ridiculous element that I don't buy into at any point in time. The medical thing is a lot different, but you have to be satisfied with the medical reports to be able to say we have the confidence to draft them because it is significant and you don't want to be drafting players that run the risk of not being able to perform at the heights of their abilities. But they have to be satisfied and like Evgeny Kuznetsov, I think Henrik Lapierre could be that type of home run pick that we saw with Afghani Kuznetsov. The, the Capitals had to like what they yeah. saw in these two games on the yeah. weekend because he's not a shooter. He's a playmaker. He's always a, a pass first guy. He doesn't want to shoot the puck. In those goals that he scored outside of the empty netter, obviously, he scored with a decent shot from the slot. The knock on him, even in spite of the fact that he's viewed having elite playmaking ability and a really strong two-way presence, is that he doesn't always get to the front of the net. He doesn't always get to the inside. And that is something that he's going to have to continue to work on. And quite aside from the injury history, there were some teams that were concerned that too much perimeter play, too much of a playmaker, not of enough a guy that takes it to the hole. And in this instance, he's already started to score some goals in the Quebec League. So the early returns are promising on that front. He's never at any level that he's played at, uh, at uh, recently in the last two or three, four years. He's never scored 20 goals in any league that he's played in. He's a playmaker, but hey, there's nothing wrong with that if you're an elite playmaker, and that's what the scouting report is on him. Yeah, there's a guy named Nick Baxter who's not getting any younger, and he's more of a pass-first guy rather than a shoot-first guy, and everything on their power play, which is usually in the top five in the league, goes through Nick Baxter and Stick Liam. So I think this is really smart. They don't have to rush him. You got Baxter, you got Kuznetsov, you got Lars yep. Eller, so there's no need to rush him into the Washington Capitals lineup. He can get rehabbed. I think there's a really smart play by Brian McClellan and the scouting staff in Washington. All right, so LaPierre's the pick. The Flyers are on the clock here. I just want to wrap up the Capitals really quickly here because we talk about a young town coming in at 18. Any chance that a 38-year-old goaltender, Henrik Lundqvist, might be joining the mix <laughs> as well, Bob? It's, it's possible. Obviously bought out by the New York Rangers, um, but there's a strong sense that the, uh, the logical landing place for... Henrik Lundqvist, the king, would be to be with the Washington Capitals, platooning with Ilya Samsonov this coming season. Uh, they will have stay tuned on that uh, yeah. when we get to Friday. Nothing can be agreed to until Friday, but it's a good bet that the king ends up in D.C. Waited 22 picks, but the Caps, perhaps the most interesting team so far in this draft. LaPierre, Lundqvist maybe, but right now the Flyers. Philadelphia Flyers general manager Chuck Fletcher will be making the 23rd selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. This past July, Philadelphia Flyer scout Jack McElhargy passed away after a battle with cancer. Jack made countless contributions to the Flyers over the years as a player, assistant coach, and scout. Today and every day, we miss Jack's insight, wit, and sense of humor. Jack played a big role in the drafting of several players currently within our organization. This draft, we honor and remember Jack as we select the next class of Flyers prospects. With the 23rd selection, Philadelphia selects from Barry Tyson Forster. Tyson Forster, the pick here, almost 6'2", almost 200 pounds. Here's a guy who... At 80 points in 62 games in the OHL. But we look at these comparisons, you get a pretty timely one given what we just saw in the postseason <laughs> bubble, Craig. Yes, we do. And, you know, when I first watched Tyson Forster play, and the more I watched him play, it just reminded me more and more of Corey Perry. And like Corey Perry at the same age, his skating wasn't fully developed because he wasn't physically mature. But when I watched Tyson Forster play, I just continuously saw a player that did so many things similar to Corey Perry. From his ability to make plays, for his hunger around the net, for his touch around the net, he might not have, have the same agitating qualities because it's a different type of game now than when Corey Perry was breaking in. But make no mistake about it, 
about it. Tyson Forster has a lot of similarities, and if you're the Philadelphia Flyers, that type of player, that type of edgy player that can score, boy, what a nice fit for them. I also want to add this. Todd Hardy, one of their scouts in Philadelphia, was in Anaheim when they drafted Corey Perry. I have to think that he saw those same similarities. And I'm not suggesting that Tyson Forster is Mark Stone, but Tyson Forster owes a debt of gratitude to Mark Stone. <laughs> because when Mark Stone was drafted out of the Western Hockey League by the Ottawa Senators, he was drafted in the fourth round because he wasn't a very good skater. He was a big guy, had a really good shot, had a nose for the net, but he couldn't skate, and people wondered if you could project him as a National Hockey League player. Very similar scenario with Forster. If he's got a real awkward skating stride, there are some teams I talk to that believe his skating stride is a fatal flaw, that he won't be able to fix it, and if you believe that, he's not a first-round pick. But if you're one of the teams that did believe it, and we had him as the consensus number 29 pick to go in the first round, if you believe that you can fix the skating stride, the Philadelphia Flyers obviously do, you're getting one of the best one-time shooters in this draft for the Barry Colts. A big body, can one-time a puck on the power play, can score from far out, and has a real nose for the net. So it'll be interesting, and he's got good hockey sense like Mark Stone. He's gonna need to work on his skating and polish up his game, but the Flyers obviously believe he's capable of skating, of, of straightening out the skating stride and that it's not a fatal flaw. So what's fascinating for me is not only when I watched Tyson Forster did I see similarities to Corey Perry, but also hearing Bob talk about the reservations that scouts had on Tyson Forster, they were the same exact reservations they had on Corey Perry. It doesn't matter what your stride looks like. Do you get to the right places at the right time? I see too many players who are really fast and they get nowhere fast. Tyson Forster isn't one of those guys. You know, the one thing about him, you got to do one thing that's super elite if you don't skate very well, and he can shoot the puck at a super elite level, and that's one thing that's going to help him because he'll always find a spot for a guy that's got a natural knack to get the puck to the back of the net. I think part of that skating problem can be fixed, and I think the Flyers will do that with him, but he can shoot the puck unbelievably I, well. I think he has a physical maturity problem, not a skating issue, and yeah. I think once the physical maturity comes, he gets yeah. stronger in his legs and he works at it, he's only going to get better. I don't see a flaw in Tyson Forster's skating. And he joins a young core, a very good young core in Philadelphia, and you do wonder, as Bob mentioned, if Mark Stone makes you reevaluate how you scout some of these young guys. If he can just make plays or if he can just shoot, you've got some value here, but you look at this young core right now, and you look at Philadelphia, team on the rise here, uh, and a team that, let's face it, they got in the playoffs here, and I think the way they played in the round robin, everyone started to say, oh, this could be a team that makes a run all the way to the cup, but built for the next few years here, Pierre? Oh, I think so, 100%, especially when you look at the goal with Carter Hart. I mean, they're going in the right direction, big time. Proveroff's development this year was fantastic for them. Konechny had a huge year. Obviously, they're going to miss Matt Niskanen. They will miss Matt Niskanen. There's no question they will miss him because of the yeah. influence he had on Proveroff. Niskanen just retiring yesterday. That being said, they're going in the right direction, big time. Were you all surprised by that? Year left for Niskanen that... Uh... No, he's just a, he's a guy from northern Minnesota. He says, I've had enough, you know, it's time to go and just chill out, and he's going to do that. Where is he from in northern Minnesota? Virginia. I knew you knew. That's why I asked. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Forster, he's the pick for the Philadelphia Flyers at 23, but now it's Calgary, and Calgary, it's been a journey here to number 24. Because <laughs> traded down twice. They were at 19. They traded with the New York Rangers, and they moved down. And then, of course, the Caps moved up and grabbed Hendricks LaPierre at number 22, which was, at that point before that, occupied by the Calgary Flames. So they trade down to 24. All right, presuming that they do not trade down <laughs> again, gentlemen. Craig, I'll go to you. Is there a player here that you would recommend they would take at 24? Well, I mean, they haven't drafted a defenseman in their last 14 consecutive picks after selecting Yuso Valimaki. So you look at the prospect cupboard, it, when you open it up and look at the defense shelf, it's not very plentiful. In fact, that's an area that if they like a defenseman, this is the exact spot to look at them. And there's a number of them on the board that play both right defense and left defense. I have a feeling they're keeping this one. They're not dealing it. They're going to make a pick. We'll find out right now. Calgary Flames general manager Brad Trey Living will be making the 24th selection in the 2020 NHL draft. Thanks, Gary. 
I'm proud to introduce to make our 2020 selection uh, former Flames captain, former Flames great, and Hockey Hall of Famer, Lanny McDonald. Lanny? Thank you, Brad. It's been almost 50 years since my name was called at the NHL draft. It's one of those great memories in a young player's career, and still to this day, it is for me. Now, the draft has certainly changed a lot since my day in 1973. But no matter if it's a phone call, a big stage, or today virtual, it's a special day and an honor to pull on an NHL jersey over your head for the first time. I have the privilege tonight to welcome this young man to the Calgary Flames to carry on our traditions and legacy. I'll ask Flames Director of Amateur Scouting, Todd Button, to bring the jersey forward. Thank you, Todd. And with the, the 24th selection in the 2020 NHL entry draft, the Calgary Flames select center Connor Zari from the Kamloops Blazers. You got to hand it to Calgary. That is showmanship. Connor Zari, the selection there. Now, I could give you his height, his weight. I give you the stats from last year. I could give you who he compares to. But better yet, let me just inform you that he is yet another one of Craig Buttons and crushes. Go ahead, Craig. Well, you see the top end, and he's a Swiss Army knife, and he really is able to play in so many different situations in the game. He can play center ice, he can play the wing, he can be offensive, he can be defensive, he can be a catalyst for forward checking, and coaches love the versatility of players like that. He, three years I've watched him play, and every single time I went to watch him the next time, he was better than the previous time. His game kept expanding, his game yeah. kept getting better and better and better and he reminds me a lot of Calgary Flames player Elias Lindholm who has those same types of qualities plays on the wing they can put him in the middle of the ice plays on the power play and shorthanded really a terrific young player so Zary the pick there at 24 Calgary they traded down twice and they eventually make their pick and now it's the Colorado Avalanche they pick at 25 they're on the clock they're so much uncertainty had to wait a long time 22 picks but Hendrix Lapierre the sense of relief the sense of joy a member of the Washington Capitals and here with Jamie Hirsch Hendrix congratulations on going to the Washington Capitals who actually traded up to get you what does that tell you about the team and what does it mean to you that they would do so yeah well obviously it's amazing it's an amazing feeling uh, growing up I know Washington is probably one of my favorite teams because of, of Ovechkin so uh, wearing that jersey today feels feels really good, and obviously uh, the fact that they traded for me it feels pretty good as well. Uh, I mean, it, I, I feel like it can't be really negative. So, uh, looking forward to the the future. This past year has been really tough on you. I know you've dealt with several injuries and worked hard to be able to bounce back and be a kind of player that someone would draft in the first round. So, what does it mean to you that the Capitals were able to take that risk on you? Yeah, well, right now I believe it's not a risk anymore, but obviously I had a really tough season last year with, with the injuries and, um, you know, wasn't able to be with my teammates as much. It was really a tough year, um, you know, wanting to be on the ice that much. So um, I feel like, you know, being drafted today, especially by Washington, is, is absolutely amazing. I feel like it's the cherry on the Sunday to a, a pretty negative season. So uh, looking forward to the future, as I mentioned, and I'm um, really, really happy. I know your current teammate, Dawson Mercer, was drafted just a little bit before you. Is there going to be a friendly competition between the two of you going forward in your pro careers? No, I don't think so. You know, obviously, we're probably going to see each other a little bit and all that stuff. And, um, but I was really, really, really happy for him when he got drafted. Um, I know he's probably going to be happy for me as well. So we'll keep putting each other on the ice as, as we've been doing since we started camp. And um, we'll see what happens in the future. But I, be I believe, you know, he's a really hard worker. And, um, I am as well, so, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the future, yeah. I know your mom is looking on proudly, so thanks so much for the time, and congratulations to you and your family. Thanks, I appreciate it. I'm sure she does as well. It was one of those happy moments for everyone who was watching yes. this draft, and now we look ahead. It's the Avs at 25. Fifth selection. 
in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Colorado Avalanche General Manager Joe Sackick. Thank you, uh, Gary. Uh, with the 25th pick, the Colorado Avalanche are proud to select from the Halifax Mooseheads, Justin Barron. So Justin Barron, the pick, the defenseman, almost 6'2", just under 200 pounds. For Joe Sackick, Bob, Craig, how happy do you think it made him to say, from the Halifax Mooseheads? <laughs> well, if you've ever been to Halifax, you're always happy to have a little Moosehead when you're in uh, Halifax. But Justin Barron, he missed significant time last year because of a blood clot. He had another surgical procedure that's prevented him from playing at the beginning of this Quebec Major Junior Hockey League season. But Justin, a couple of seasons ago, was a very promising young player, a player that had a lot of potential, went to the Memorial Cup with the Halifax Mooseheads, and then kind of ran into that, what do you call a plateau, in his play. It was no fault of his own, because you have to believe that what ultimately was diagnosed with the blood clot certainly could have affected that but he moves the puck well he's very cerebral i don't think he's going to be a huge point producer but you need to be able to skate you need to be able to move the puck out of your own zone and much like hendrix lapierre you have to believe that the colorado avalanche were satisfied with the medical reports they received on justin Barron, and they're not going to ask him to play a frontline role because they have kale mccarr on the right side to do that yeah next to hendrix lapierre this would have been the biggest medical question mark because because of the blood clot that you talked about, only played 34 games last season. Uh, right, right shooting defensemen are always at a premium. When you're six foot two, 190 pounds, and you can skate like Justin Barron can skate, uh, you're able to skate right by some of those medical concerns. Yeah, there's one component in Colorado that they stress. They want guys that are fast and are pretty big, and you can look at this player, and that's the one thing. He's big and he can skate. His brother, uh, obviously, yeah. already drafted out of Cornell, played, just signed with the New York Rangers, was a Hobie Baker nominee last year Morgan so he comes from obviously great bloodline for hockey but the biggest thing about Colorado is how they're building their team it's about size and speed well you think size speed and you think Halifax Mooseheads yeah. and you think about Colorado and you think about Nathan McKinnon because there's some spies there's some speed right there and as you mentioned with Kel McCarr I mean it's not a bad guy Pierre if you're gonna bring in defenseman guy who can skate if you're gonna learn behind this is a guy you you know who jumped right in I mean literally his first game first shot the, the best NFL. thing that ever happened to Kale McCarr is he spent an extra year at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and he played for a former NHL assistant in Greg Carville who runs that program up there and I can tell you right now Kale McCarr would be the first person to tell you that helped him so much he wasn't rushed into the NHL gets into the NHL and he's ready for prime time and he's been outstanding ever since he got to Colorado I do a ton of their games and this guy is a dominant player and, and Pierre let me tell you a guy that would have benefited from staying another year in college was Tyson Jost he left a year too soon and it's affected his play at the National Hockey League level and Kale McCarr did not make the same miscue or misstep or mistake in my view and you now look at Tyson Jost who was a high pick him leaving a year too soon is the perfect example. If you're not ready for the NHL, it will chew you up and spit you out like nothing. 100%, and that's why what McCarr did was so wise. He was coming off a of World Junior where everybody was talking about him, and all of a sudden he goes to see Greg Carvel, and Carvel says, you know what, you can go or you can leave, but we want you to stay for one more year so you never have to go down in the American Hockey League, and there's no knock in the American yep. Hockey League. That's just the reality of it. And that kid went back, he went to Hobie Baker, and look at what's happened ever since. Well, there's no arguing with the timing of Cal McCarr no. because one day you're playing in college, the next you're in mm -hmm. the playoffs, and on your first shot, you're scoring your first goal. So it feels like he stepped right in and had no problem picking up right where he left off in college from, and into the pros. So Colorado, their pick is in, and now we look ahead, and it's the St. Louis Blues here at 26. Bob, St. Louis Blues team a couple years ago won the Stanley Cup, that incredible run. Head coach Craig Berube, Doug Armstrong, the GM, who do you think they possibly could be targeting here? Best available for you at this point? Well, your guess is as good as mine, to be honest. Jacob Perot's our best available, but he's a polarizing player. He's got a lot of offensive ability, but highly inconsistent. J.J. Paterka, the third member of the German trio who could go in the first round here. Ridley Gregg, the son of Mark Gregg, 
Philadelphia Flyer scout and former National Hockey League player, a very abrasive player that's got some really good skating abilities. So it'll be interesting here. Keep in mind, too, that Bill Armstrong, not to be confused with Doug, uh, just left as the assistant general manager there in St. Louis, and he was uh, a big factor for how the draft would proceed. And he's now that he is the general manager with the Arizona Coyotes, He's not permitted to be in the Arizona Coyote draft room, even though they don't have a first-round pick today anyways. But that was part of the condition of him leaving the St. Louis Blues to go to Arizona as general manager. I don't think that'll impact things one way or the other. The Doug Armstrong staff is otherwise pretty much intact, so I'll be curious to see where they go with this one. I mean, this is one question. Obviously, it's a big one. We're in the draft. They're picking here at 26, but I... Let's face it, I mean, the biggest question for the St. Louis Blues right now is that this is a team that went to the Stanley Cup, won the Stanley Cup. Alex Petrangelo was such a huge part of that run. You may say he was the, probably the runner-up for the Con Smythe. Unrestricted free agent, Pierre, quickly, how do you see this playing out here? Oh, I don't know about him going back there or not. It's going to be a dicey negotiation. Don't forget Jay Bowmeister either. Jay Bowmeister probably not coming back, and that's a problem. You lose two guys in your top four, that's a problem. Yeah, big-time talent, core guys playing the way that the Blues like to play, but here they are, 26. The 26th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by St. Louis Blues general manager, Doug Armstrong. The St. Louis Blues select from Edmonton, Jake Neighbors. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> The biggest house party we've seen here. Jake Neighbors' selection, just a hair under six feet, just under 200 pounds, left wing, 70 points in 64 games for the Edmonton Oil Kings this past season, Craig. So what I would say about Jake Neighbors, if you want to look at a comparable type player, a comparable style, look at Milan Lucic. And at the same point of their careers in junior hockey, the same things that maybe people had with respect to concerns on Milan Lucic are similar to Jake Neighbors. There's no question that he's a hard-nosed, competitive, physical player who's exceptionally smart. But like Milan Lucic, they have to improve their skating. Now, Jake Neighbors has shown a real capability to play at the necessary pace, but the National Hockey League is two steps higher than what he's played at in the Western Hockey League. But he's hardworking, he's determined, and he brings significant, significant elements to a team strong at the net strong along the boards and like Milan Lucic no fun to play against yeah there's a sandpaper component there's no question of Jake Neighbors game and anybody you talk to or anybody you've played against will tell you the same thing there's there's a little bit of nasty stuff going on there yeah Bob it sounds like Craig Berube's gonna love this guy <laughs> uh, absolutely, but as Craig said, as as our Craig, not Craig Berube said, I'm um, going to need some seasoning and some time. So this is a, a patient pick for the St. Louis Blues. Let him finish his junior career and uh, go through the process it takes to get to the National Hockey League. And Bob, I do want to come right back to you because, you know, we were quick on that Alex Petrangelo conversation. Obviously, it deserves a little bit more time to breathe here because it's such a big, big situation yes. with the St. Louis Blues. As you look ahead to free agency... Honestly, I mean, how do you see this playing out between Petrangelo, the Blues, and really the rest of the league? Well, unless Doug Armstrong and the St. Louis Blues come back with a final offer before Friday, and the offer is more than what they offered last time and comes with a different structure than it did last time, I would say it's more likely than not that Alex Petrangelo is going to go to the free agent market at 12 noon Eastern time on this Friday. Um, but... I mean, what is it, Tuesday night? I lose track of the days here, but there's still <laughs> lots of time for conversations to uh, to occur. But I don't know that right now there's this overwhelming sense of optimism that Petrangelo will be back in St. Louis. But by the same token, I couldn't sit here and tell you the door is closed. He's not coming back to St. Louis. So I think we'll just have to see how this plays out. But I think it's fair to say that the negotiations that have taken place thus far um, probably haven't excited Alex Petrangelo to the point where he thinks there's anything even remotely on the table that he's willing to take from the St. Louis Blues. So unless things change dramatically between now and Friday, there's a real good chance he's going to be going to market. Quickly, now, though, Bob, I'm sorry, quickly, Bob, how big is the market given the current situation in the, in the NHL uh, economically and all the uncertainty? Well, 
Well, you're right. It's a flat cap and for who knows how long. And I, and I know everybody's looking for big trades and big movement and all of that. It could well be that there's going to be an economic paralysis here, that there's so many teams trying to dump money that they're all trying to do it at the same time. The market's flooded and it makes dealing very difficult. But when you're a player like Alex Petrangelo, somebody will find the money for you. And, I, and, I, and that may apply to Taylor Hall as well, the marquee offensive free agent in this draft. But it may also be that a guy like Taylor Hall might have to do a shorter term deal than he would have liked to end up on a team where he wants to be. And, and that's what Alex Petrangelo is looking at too. It's one thing to get the money and the money's important as is the structure of the contract. But Alex Petrangelo at this stage doesn't necessarily want to go to a team that looks like it might be five years away from from uh, winning the Stanley Cup. So you got to weigh all that into what's going on. And I know the Vegas Golden Knights, amongst others, are teams, Toronto Maple Leafs, that are interested in Alex Petrangelo. But there, there, there'll be lots of teams, and some team will find the money that will make him happy if it's not the St. Louis Blues. We'll see how it develops going forward right now. It's the Ducks on the clock. The pick is in as we go back to the commissioner. Anaheim Ducks assistant general manager Martin Madden will be making the 27th selection in the 2020 NHL draft. The Anaheim Ducks are excited to select from the Starnia Sting, Jacob Perrault. Well, there's our best available. Yep. Jacob Perot, the number 21 man on our rankings. He's a fascinating guy because he's got NHL bloodlines. His dad, of course, Yannick. No panic, Yannick Perot. <laughs> now, here's the thing. People are going to say he's not at all like his dad, and he's not in terms of the way that he plays. But I will tell you this. When he skates out on the ice and you look at him, I go, oh, my God, that's, that's Yannick Perot. And then the game starts, and he's the exact opposite of his dad. His dad was a face-off specialist, a conscientious, detail-oriented guy who put as much emphasis on the defensive side of the game as the offensive side, and he was an absolute... Um, you know, attention to detail guy showed up every shift. Jacob Perot is lightning fast. <laughs> CHL top prospect skating. He finished tops in so many different categories. He's got electrifying offensive ability, and the scouts go to watch him, and that sometimes he's the best player on the ice scoring magic goals, and then sometimes he doesn't show up at all, and he doesn't have any of the attention to detail or the defensive conscious or the effort consistent effort that his dad gave but he's certainly got talent and upside but there's a this is an incomplete package that needs a lot of work to come together but boy he's a talented player so like father like son in terms of they both play hockey and then <laughs> different after that up next ottawa senators their third pick here in the first round changing draft and it began with the third overall pick Tim Stutzla from Germany and then the only American drafted so far here first American selected is Jake Sanderson son Jeff Sanderson top defenseman selected in this draft so it's Stutzla third overall then Sanders Sanderson fifth overall and now they selected 28 so Stutzla the first German taken since then, another German has been selected. Any chance that we get a third German selected here and the second for the Ottawa Senators, Craig? Well, well, let me tell you a little interesting fact about J.J. Paterka, who we're talking about as potentially a pick here for the Ottawa Senators, and Tim Stutzla. At the World Junior Championships in 2020 in Czech Republic, J.J. Paterka scored four goals. On three of them, Tim Stutzla was the key setup guy. I don't know, you might want to look for a little bit of German chemistry. And certainly J.J. Paterka would qualify, but we see, you know, one of Bob's best availables still here is Ridley Gregg, an edgy centerman, much in the mold of Nazem Kadri of the Colorado Avalanche. So, you know, again, lots of good options for the Ottawa Senators, but with the four second-round picks coming up too, this is really significant for the future of their organization. So... Time taken down under a half minute before the Ottawa Senators make their, make their third and final pick here in the first round. Again, picked at three, picked at five. Got Tim Stutzla, 
who we had locked in at top three, was either going to go second or third. It was Byfield who went second, Stutzler third. And then, as we mentioned, it was Jake Sanderson, the American, the defenseman at five. And now at 28, their third pick, the Senators. Trent Mann, chief amateur scout for the Ottawa Senators, will be making the 28th selection in the first round of the 2020 NHL draft. With the 28th selection, the Ottawa Senators are proud to select from Brandon of the WHL, Ridley Gregg. So, Ridley Gregg, second straight pick where they take the son of a former NHL player. And it's not often we get to say this in the first round. We know he's got skill, but this is a guy who also likes to engage physically. 83 penalty minutes to go along with those 60 points and actually earned a couple of suspensions along the way. Craig, this is a guy with some bite. Oh, yeah, he has bite. And he, I compare him to Nazem Kadri, and they're not tripping penalties and hooking penalties and interference penalties. They're aggressive penalties. He gets into the face of opponents. He can kill penalties. He can play on the power play. He can contribute offensively, and he is not easy to play against. He was Brandon's first-round draft pick. He needed some time to physically mature, and that is ongoing, but he's just continuously improved and become more impactful as he has grown physically. Stutzel, the third overall pick. That was the one they got with the trade for Eric Carlson. This one right here, the trade for Jean JG Pajot. They get Greg, Father Mark Greg, playing parts of nine NHL seasons. Here's the interesting part of this for Ottawa. Jake Sanderson's father, Jeff, played for the Hartford Whalers. Riley Gregg's father, Mark, played for the Hartford Whalers. He and Jeff Sanderson, Mark Gregg and Jeff Sanderson, best buds when they were part of the Hartford Whalers organization. Now their boys are playing for the same NHL team. I'm not sure how often that happens. Pretty cool note there. I was a coach. <laughs> well, that's why we went to you. <laughs> first hand Edwards winding down the first round of the 2020 NHL draft. Three picks remain. We're at 29. Vegas is on the clock. Less than 90 seconds remain before they have to make their pick here. Before we get into the pick, let's just talk Vegas in general because they give Robin Leonard that five-year extension. So, Pierre, I'll start with you. What do you think this means for Marc-Andre Fleury? Well, I'm sure they're exploring opportunities or ways of trying to trade Marc-Andre Fleury, but he's got to probably agree to wherever they want to move him, so that's part of it. And they're, i got to think, because of the way things are economically around the league, they're probably going to have to eat some of his money. So it's not an easy deal. So as we look at the goalies here, Bob, what do you see the market for Marc-Andre Fleury right now? Well, I'm sure there are some teams interested, but are they on Marc Fleury? Uh, Mark Andre Fleury's no-fly list, and that's one of the problems that uh, right now Kelly McCrimmon and the Vegas Golden Knights are trying to deal with. That's something they'll have to figure out in the future. Right now, it's the pick at 29. <laughs> The 29th selection in the 2020 NHL draft will be made by Vegas Golden Knights general manager Kelly McCrimmon. With the 29th selection in the first round of the entry draft, the Vegas Golden Knights are pleased to select from the Chicago Steel of the USHL forward Brendan Brisson. Brendan Brisson, that name sounds familiar. His father, Pat Brisson, a top NHL agent. They're hugging it out, celebrating, and before we finish up, I'm glad we get to it. One more time, another <laughs> man crush <laughs> for Craig. I, I usually get one of these in the course of the draft, but I'm happy to have three because Brendan Brisson is another player who, watching him when he was in Shattuck St. Mary's, to his progression to the Chicago Steel, an outstanding program in the USHL. Again, just better. Each successive time I went to watch him, his game expanded. His game got more influential in critical areas of the game. I think he's a lot like Pierre-Luc Dubois, the Columbus Blue Jackets, in that you want to skate, I'll skate with you. You want to shoot, I can shoot with you. I can play make as good as anybody, and I'm in the fight. I'm in the battle. I'm there for one reason, and my goal is to win. And Brendan Brisson does exactly that. 
You look at his improvement since I watched him as a youngster with Shattuck St. Mary's. It's tremendous, and it's only going to get better while he plays at the University of Michigan and Mel Pearson. Totally agree with everything you just said. Ditto, ditto, and ditto. Biggest thing is character. This guy has serious character, and going to the University of Michigan and playing for Mel Pearson is a tremendous thing. It's going to help him a ton. So we saw Jake Sanderson go at number five, and now the second-ranked American, Brendan Brisson. He goes here at 29 to Vegas. We're into the final couple of picks here, Bob. Brisson, you see him celebrate again. Part of the Golden Knights organization, but here we are. We're down to two picks, 30-31. It's Dallas, it's San Jose. So you dig deep into that list right now. And two guys who you believe, two guys who you think should be or expected to be first-rounders, are there two guys who are still available in your mind? Well, if we're looking at our best available list, we've got uh, John Jason Paterka, the German player, our number 23-ranked player, is still available. We've got Maverick Bork, a center from the Quebec League. William Wallinder, a big six foot four defenseman from Sweden, and Noel, Noel, Noel Gundler, a very inconsistent but skilled and talented uh, Swedish forward. So those are the only players left on our best available list that were ranked in the first round that haven't gone yet. So right now we've only ended up with uh, two outliers, um, Mukhan Medulin and Shinikov, uh, the two Russians that went to New Jersey and Columbus at 20 and 21. Otherwise, the best available list of, of our rankings has gone pretty much. So if that holds true, I mean, Dallas and San Jose could take any one of those guys, but uh, we'll see where it goes. And uh, just a quick note on Liam, I know you want to wave the American flag as you should. Uh, and it's not a good year for Americans, but it's just an anomaly. It has nothing to do with the development system. It has nothing to do with the U.S. program. It's just a cyclical thing in nature. You had 11 first-rounders last year, only two first-rounders this year. And while I like to joke with you, Liam, <laughs> that Jake Sanderson and Brendan Brisson have very proud Canadian fathers from Hay River uh, in the Northwest yes. Territories, and Pat Brisson, of course, the French-Canadian agent from the province of Quebec, um, nevertheless... Uh, Brendan Brisson played all his hockey in the States and uh, is uh, continuing to do that in the USHL and will at University of Michigan as well. You know, it's not that I'm dying to wave the flag. It's just I'm saying in the limited opportunity I get to exactly. wave that flag, you don't have to rain on my parade, you know? Let me You're have correct. those moments. <laughs> You're correct. That's all I'm asking. You're correct. All right, two I just picks. knew that, I know Keith Jones isn't here no. and that somebody needs to keep you a little bit honest, Liam. No, he's, well, he, don't worry, he's texting me abuse as we go. So he's on, just he's on this, top William. of it. Brendan Brisson grew up in California. Yes. I mean, other than maybe going to Quebec in the summertime to visit his grandparents, <laughs> he's an American through and through. Yes, he is. And Jake Sanderson was the captain of the national team development program. I think he wears the stars and stripes very proudly. Real strong making those comments, Bob, from all the way up in Toronto on the virtual draft here. Brave moment for you here on TV. All right, let's try to focus and regroup because we've got less than 90 seconds. The Dallas Stars have went all the way to the Stanley Cup final here. Incredible run during this bubble postseason. No picks in the second and third round, so picking 30th here tonight. Craig, I'll go to you. At this point, you would make the case for whom? Well, you could make the case for any number of players. What I'm going to tell you about the Dallas Stars, if you go back and you look at their picks from the last two years, Ty DeLandry, who they took at 13, a superb two-way center that's going to be in their lineup sooner rather than later. And last year, Thomas Harley, an elite skating defenseman who was in the bubble. DeLandry was in the bubble with the Dallas Stars as well. You know, that can benefit them as they lost some development time from playing in the OHL. But Dennis Gurion, off. I mean, people said, oh boy, they were surprised. Look at the emergence of him. I think that the Dallas Stars have a really good beat on their scouting process, and they're not going to be hesitant to draft any type of player that's going to fit for them long term. And their, their future is promising because these players are really good, and that blue line looks terrific. Well, they put on a show for all of us over the summer, and then in the bubble, they win the West, they go to the final, lose the Tampa Bay Lightning, and now they pick here. At number 30, two picks left to go. Let's hear what Dallas Stutz at third. Dallas Stars Assistant General Manager Scott White will be making the 30th selection in the 2020 NHL Draft. 
With the 30th selection in the 2020 NHL draft, the Dallas Stars select Maverick Bork of Shawinigan. So Maverick Bork, the pick here. The center of the 30th selection. All right, go right back to you, Craig. What can you tell us? Well, Maverick is a player that's not going to give you a lot of flash and dash. He just simply isn't that type of player. But he can beat up opponents mentally because he's acumen for the game with respect to playing with the puck, with respect to not playing with the puck, is exceptional. He gets the most out of the players he plays with. He understands how to get the puck into the right places on the ice. He doesn't get himself caught up in a game that he cannot excel in. He doesn't try to take you on physically, because quite frankly, he's not a physical player. But he finds that open ice. He's a great player at moving the puck and then getting to the next spot where he can take advantage. And do not underestimate his competitiveness. Still waters run deep. And Maverick Bork is a very, very competitive player. One more thing about Maverick Bork. Shawinigan was playing in Shakutami on Friday, October 2nd against Hendricks Lapierre and Dawson Mercer. That gave scouts, the 40 scouts that were there, another opportunity to watch him after he had been injured down the stretch with a wrist injury. Nice, smart player that fits for the Dallas Stars, no question. You know what's amazing about him? He's not a super fast skater for a guy that's not overly large, but man, oh man, he knows how to manufacture offense in confined areas, and it's something that's really impressive about him. I think it speaks to his hockey sense and his awareness as a player, but that's the one thing. For him as a smaller guy to make the next step, and this is not somebody that's playing next year uh, or the year after. He's going to take some time, but this skating is going to have to come up a little bit, but he is a very intelligent player. You have five foot 10, 178, yeah. and all the quotes about him from his former coach is all about hockey IQ. So with mm -hmm. Maverick Bork, that makes 18 Canadian-born players taken so far in the first round of this draft. That's the most since 2003 when 19 were taken. And I look at that and I say, well, that's a note that I would have thought Bob would have had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't get too hung up on the numbers, no. Liam. So, and, and besides, you, you should celebrate that fact because you did go to the University of Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken. And, of course, everybody knows yes. that Buffalo is part of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get it in. With one pick to go, we were that close. Uh. We do have one pick left, all right? And it is the San Jose Sharks on the clock right now. Just about three minutes remaining here. San Jose been interesting here because making some moves obviously they acquire Ryan Donato they acquire mm -hmm. Devin Dubnik Pierre I'll start with you you look ahead for the Sharks team next year they make these moves they're trying what do you to project with yeah, this team Yeah, they're trying here? to retool it on the fly, and I totally get it. They've got a young coaching staff in there. Um, you know, Bobby Bugner takes over from Pete DeBoer, who moves on to Vegas, and I think what they're trying to do is just accelerate the pace of how they're going to rebuild it on the fly more than anything else. San Jose, well, is, you think Bob San Jose done making deals here, done making moves? Uh, hard to say at this point. Uh, everybody's going to be looking at... Uh, the situation between now and Friday, uh, I'm sure they're going to be looking to improve their hockey team, but they feel like they've shored up their goaltending with Devin Dubnik coming over, and uh, we'll have to see where they go from there. You, you know, Liam, Doug Wilson just recently inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, deservedly so. You know, he's been a terrific manager for the San Jose Sharks. He, he's, he's aggressive, he's bold, he's not afraid to try to do things that maybe other teams don't even consider. So I don't think it's going to be any different here. Their defense is really good. Their forwards, they have Timo Meyer, Logan Couture, uh, players that can really play and help their team. What they don't have is that consistency in the net that's really hindered him he's hoping that the Devin Dubnik acquisition can solidify that but I have no doubt in my mind that what Doug Wilson is looking to do is to ensure that this team can get back to the playoffs and I'm not going to bet against Doug Wilson in doing exactly that all right we have just about one minute remaining before we get back to the commissioner and he sends it to San Jose for the final pick here so this is it. You know, you're a player. You want to get drafted. You want to say that you're a first-rounder. One pick left. Craig and Bob, I send it back to you. Give me one guy right now that stands out. John, John Jason Paterka. They drafted Mar Marco Sturm, a German. They drafted Marcel Gotch, a German. Why not take another German? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually surprised that our list has held up as well as it has given the pandemic and the the uneven scouting process that's gone on. So at this point, I would suggest that 
I got to believe that somebody maybe off the board, somebody that's not <laughs> in our top 31 is, is much more likely to end up uh, with this final pick. Bob, for the record, I never doubted you for a moment. I knew it would hold up. We go to the commissioner right now. Final pick, first round, the San Jose Sharks. The San Jose Sharks director of amateur scouting, Doug Wilson Jr., will make the 31st pick of the 2020 NHL draft. The San Jose Sharks are proud to select from the Prince Albert Raiders, Ozzy Weisblatt. <laughs> <laughs> Celebration on, and Bob, as you mentioned, a little off the board. I don't know if you know what he just did there, Doug Wilson Jr. He signed, because Ozzy Weisblatt's mother is deaf. And, I mean, that is so significant. It, it's really touching to connect with the family like that. They all signed because their mother has sacrificed so much and been so supportive. And Ozzy Weisblatt, he's a Zach Hyman-type player. Play him anywhere in the lineup. He's got energy, he's got smarts, he can skate, and he can do so many things. What a great moment there to end the first round as we go back to the commissioner. We have now concluded the first round of the 2020 NHL draft. We resume the draft tomorrow at 11.30 Eastern time uh, under the supervision of Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly, who will start the second round. Good night, everyone. Be safe. Stay healthy. So the first round complete, but I know we were tight for time there going back to the commissioner, but I, I want to replay and, Craig, bring you back in what just happened with that final pick in San Jose because I, I, I think it's a moment you want to savor. It's, it's a moment, it's a big moment in anyone's life to be drafted, but to have this and to have it be so personal, uh, it's a special, special moment right there, Craig. Well, all the kids know, but he was also talking to Ozzy's mother. Who, who's deaf, yeah. and it's significant. I mean, we saw some special moments in this draft with the Winnipeg Jets having Crystal Howard Chuck make the selection at 10 for the for the retired number 10 Winnipeg Jets superstar Dale Howard Chuck and Doug Wilson Jr. and the San Jose Sharks. I mean, it's just such a special moment. That's a great moment, and that's great attention to detail by the San yeah, Jose Sharks 100%. To, uh, to finish off the 2020, long-awaited 2020 yes. NHL draft. 31 picks in. Let's get some final thoughts here. Big picture, Pierre, I'll start with you. You're going to think back at this draft, and you're going to think what? I'm going to think Ottawa going after Jake Sanderson and getting him with the fifth pick and what that means to their franchise long term. I think Jake Sanderson was undervalued going into this draft, and I think people will appreciate him down the road for how good he's going to be for Ottawa. Uh, I want to talk about the scouts. The scouts love to scout. They love to be in arenas. They love to be out on the road working. That's what they live for. And that was taken away from them when we began the pause in March. And the amount of effort that they put in in a very different way to try to form their lists and to try to find ways to get as much information on these players in unprecedented times, they're the stars of this draft. And for me, I would say it's all the players. So we saw 31 players go, obviously, in the first round. There are a number that thought they were going to go, and they didn't go. To those kids, I would simply say, you know what? You've waited this long. You've waited <laughs> such a long time. One more day isn't going to uh, be a, a big burden to bear for you guys. And when you go through the list of players that have been drafted in the second round of the National Hockey League and have gone on to Hall of Fame careers, nothing to worry about there. But I think just overall... You know, this whole pandemic and everything that it's done, I, I often think about teenagers and, and young people and the impact that it's had on them. And, and these kids have had their hockey lives turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And I understand in the grand scheme of things, when you, when you measure the, the, the level of tragedy that's occurred all over the world because of this, um, you know, it's all relative. But nevertheless, you know, these kids have worked so hard to try and get to the National Hockey League. And for many of them to not have played a game since last March and don't know when they're going to play again. And really, it's such an uneven future. And for all the players that are in next year's draft who didn't get to go to the Ivan Holinka tournament and already are waiting to see whether the OHL is going to start or the WHL is going to start or the NCAA, it's really uncertain times for all these kids. And I would just say, to Craig's point, as a follow-up, the scouts are the stars, but so are all these kids yeah. because, um, you know, no teenager should have to go through 
all the nonsense that they've mm. had to go through because of this COVID. But then, I mean, the rest of the world shouldn't have to go through it either. And yet here we are. Well said. You know, I'll finish up just by saying that this is six years doing this. And when people ask me about it, I always said that this is the hardest thing I do. But as the years went on, I will say now it's one of the most enjoyable things I get to do. Uh, and it's really because I get to work with you guys. So and we can't all be together. We can't all be in Montreal for the draft, but at least we get to do this virtually. So it's different. It's not what we expected. It's not what we hoped for, but I'm glad we get to do it. And I really look forward to when we can see hockey again and see those NHL players out there. And one final thing as we look at the draft board here, I do want to send a special thank you out to Dan Steer, who for so many years has really championed our coverage and got it to the point it's at right now as we take a final look at the draft board and Alexi Lafreniere, the number one overall pick to the New York Rangers. He started things off. The first round in the books. That's how it started right there. And then Quentin Byfield after him to L.A. Tim Stutzel was the third pick. The German-born player goes to the Ottawa Senators. For all you at home, be sure to check out NBCSports.com all week for more draft content plus full coverage on free agency. It opens on Friday. Coming up next is Dano Char's docu-series made for this. So for Bob, Craig, and Pierre, I'm Liam. Thanks so much to everyone behind the scenes. And thanks for watching.